Oh no, hold on. Hold up one second because we've got sound issues. Um, let me fix all of that. Can you give me a quick sound check? Yes. Hello. Oh, Did that man. not work? Uh, can everybody hear Marcy now? Uh, that's embarrassing. Okay, so um, do you maybe just want to do that all one more time? We had your, your audio set to the wrong channel. Okay. Wow, I bet that was weird seeing my like mouth flapping and audio. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Monday. I'm, yeah. All right. It's it's Monday morning, everybody. Um and Jason's cool. out of coffee. So yeah. I mean if this was just this was bound to happen, we should have seen. <laughs> I mean, between that and my emoji not rendering, this is like really awesome but so look, far. Okay. Here's the here's the thing. Like we're getting it out of the way early. Like all of the badness is happening now so that the rest of the stream is going to go so well. <laughs> all right. All right. We can build this up. Okay. So okay. let me recap what nobody can hear me saying, uh, which is that we have a prototype that is an interaction prototype. Um, and it is a widget to give you a chance to give us feedback in the moment on a docs page so that if we really got it right and you're loving it and you just want to like spread the love around or maybe we totally missed something and to get that you know in the moment before you forget to file a github issue because we're all busy you know um that way you can give us um, a tip right on the doc itself what you would like to see there um, and a lot of off-the-shelf feedback widgets are not accessible to keyboard and screen reader users which so is can, a huge miss so we want to build that about how the the interaction works so like i'm i'm hitting the the tab key right now right so we can see that we just focused on the button and then yep. when i hit enter uh i'm focused on a headline and i'm like wh wh why what does that do so the button and the widget are next to each other and if you don't move the user's focus around they won't necessarily be in the right spot in the page so especially when say you're using a component library and it injects like a custom component and it's completely far separated from the button you clicked on, uh -huh. hitting the tab key into the thing after it opens may or may not work depending on where it is in the DOM. So in this widget, you click on a button and it sends your focus to a heading inside of this little widget that was display none before. So oh, in our one. real, yeah, so that's the heading. It's like inside of a form. So the feedback widget that wraps all of the, the content that we've exposed, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that that's all hidden from everyone when it's closed. Because you don't want it to be visually hidden and then you're like tabbing through and going, where am I? Oh, I'm in this hidden region. Right. So we might, we might need to play around with, like if we wanted to animate in, we might need to use something like opacity and visibility hidden or something. Because right mm -hmm. now, um, I think I'm just using the hidden attribute and toggling that on and off. Um, so what we could do for kind of the, so yeah, you could see the hidden attribute in there. If you remove that attribute, the user agent CSS will just make it visible. Um, so we're toggling it by sending focus into it, changing its display, and then there's some radio buttons that you can go through. They're supposed to display emoji and uh, yeah, that rendered. It's like a works on my machine kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, but there's there's three emoji smiley faces and frowny faces to give you kind of that fun feedback of like, oh, I'm frowning because this doc sucks and you forgot something really important. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah that I'll works. Just, I can just change them all out. Um, yeah. But yeah, we'll, uh, what was this? This one is like a, is it's this the a neutral, neutral face? face? The, yeah, not the like closed eyes neutral face. See, I even labeled the emoji, so it's kind of funny that they they didn't actually render um, because you know <laughs> you can put in an emoji or may or may not actually tell a screen reader user what that what that image is for. Um, obviously, oh, this one didn't render. The poor one that happened to me too. I don't know why that one frowning emoji renders as like black and white line text. Uh, yeah, slightly is... frowning. let's go slightly frowning face slightly. F there you go. Okay. And so now 
Now you can see what, what we're what we're going on here yeah, or what we've got going on here. So okay. I used radio buttons because then I didn't have to do a bunch of custom interaction work with JavaScript. And anytime you can use a native control in HTML, it's like you just have less work to do. It's less buggy. Um, this worked a lot better in a screen reader. So I started off with a custom thing using roving tab index and I was going to make mm. it a menu and then I tested it and it just did not work. So this was like, this took me like 10 minutes to swap it out into a, a native form with radio buttons and, and like radio can... buttons. Sorry. I was going to say that like you can have a set of multiple and make them mutually exclusive. So you can only choose one. Right. And, and I was going to say like, we, we can, if we want, like we can hide the actual radio part. Um, with like visually but still make it accessible and usable as a form element right like you I'm, can. I'm always curious yeah. about that because uh sometimes you want to mess with forms and you want to make them like very custom but it's really really hard to style form elements right so um, a lot of them yeah so maybe we some should are easier do that. than other yeah yeah for sure right like the the select drop down is a nightmare um and like stuff like that but i i've seen workarounds for this uh, so it'd be kind of cool as we do this to to play with that idea. Like, let's still let's customize this so that we don't have a radio button, but still make it a radio button and make sure that we get all those accessibility benefits. Yeah. So the if we think that through a little bit, we need something that's focusable. Mm -hmm. So if you can focus on the input, but you just don't see it rendered, mm -hmm. maybe that's the way we do this. So the element the we may, we're gonna have to test this out. So um, maybe it has, we could play with opacity or something. So like it's still mm -hmm. in the DOM, it right. doesn't have display none. Um, we need to render a, a visible focus outline. So we do Just, have some better CSS now with like sibling, adjacent sibling selectors and things. And like doesn't, um, isn't this what uh, focus within is intended to solve? Or am I, am I misunderstanding? Ooh. Um, it, it is a great tool. So there's a focus within selector. Um, the challenge here, focus within selector. Why so we're not going to, yeah, I guess that would work when you're focused within the label element that should work. Um, the input is inside of the label. And so, yeah, if we did focus within on the label element, mm -hmm. then if you're focused anywhere in there that should apply you can then apply it to like a parent and have it you know say oh my sibling sitting next to this input should have a different style yeah so if we did something like um let's see if we if we go label focus within then i'll do like border two pick solid red and what we would hope happens is that when we start tabbing through, we get, yeah. So that's that's pretty rad because it's uh, it's doing that for all of our form elements. So obviously we'll wanna, we'll wanna like customize this a little bit. And I just introduced a lot of visual jank with those borders popping in and out. So we'd wanna play with that and uh, and make sure that it actually looks right. But like, this could be a cool way to, to get that. And let's look real quick at the browser support. Like how bad is this gonna get for us? Um, Browser compatibility, so it doesn't work on IE. Let's yeah, no edge. edge. Oh, okay. I mean, you should look at what I have there right now because it we might not need it. Okay. Um, I, because that gray, I think I used a little bit of JavaScript actually um, to get, because I knew that folks women support wasn't that great. Okay. Um, I used JavaScript so that if you, I forget exactly what I wrote. I used vanilla JavaScript because this is a prototype and I didn't want to use a library and DOM APIs are actually really good. So when the radios change, because you're like either turning them on or off, I'm going through and adding a CSS class. So the label ends up getting the selected class um, that mm. if you check a radio button, you know, turn it on, mm. it will go up the, up the tree a little bit and add a CSS class. So once yeah. focus within is better supported, we could probably like get rid of this code. Okay. Um, but since I knew that we needed to add, like I, I really want to support edge and at least IE 11. Right. Um, 
that said, I have not thoroughly tested the Gatsby site 911. So this is the beginning of that process. Right. Um, yeah. so, th so there's some JavaScript here for, um, I think I'm sending focus around. A lot of this like set attribute hidden stuff, I think we could clean up a lot in React so that it's you know rendering based on state. Mm -hmm. Here it's this is like prototyping. You're just getting something, you know, that's cheap to produce, quick to validate whether it's what you want to do. Um, you know, I didn't spend an hour or a whole day setting up Webpack trying to get this prototype to work. It was mm -hmm. like the quickest validation possible. Yeah, I think um, that's always a good, that's always a good approach is like, don't, you know, don't burn a bunch of hours trying to set up a prototype the right way. Like, you know, you want to, you want to do it the, the fastest way to prove whether or not your idea is actually worth pursuing. Yeah. And actually it really did work that way because the first example that I did used a, a menu, like a, an ARIA menu. Mm. And it was like fancy roving tab index to try and mimic kind of what these radio buttons are doing, where you have like one focusable thing and the arrow keys work. It didn't work in assistive technology. So okay. the fact that I had prototyped it quickly pivoted to another example, like that's how this worked well. Yeah. Okay. So, all right, let's, uh, let's, let's start building it. What do you think? Yeah, um, that sounds good. All right. So I'm just going to do a, uh, Gatsby new in this folder and we'll use the default starter. And the, the reason that we're doing it in a, in a plain site, instead of like jumping right into the, the Gatsby site is that the Gatsby site is big and it's got a lot of moving pieces and it's kind of slow to build. And, you know, there, there are a lot of edge cases. So what I think we want to do first is, um, we want to get the the widget right and working as kind of a self-contained micro React app. And we'll make sure that it works inside the context of Gatsby. And then once it's working, we'll move it over into the, the Gatsby site so that we can kind of control for variables. Um, so that should give us, if I am correct here, we've got our site uh, installed and we've got all of our, our pieces um and this should get us set up with a like working default simple site so let's uh take a look and make sure that it actually does what we want it to do yeah i'm in the background i'm looking up how to render these emoji because yeah they they aren't rendering on my prototype either it was like something i set up locally uploaded it to send to jason and i didn't really look into it further we might need to use an icon font or mm -hmm. Something, I mean, the way that those emoji render may be different on each platform anyway, just based on how Unicode renders certain emoji. So if we wanted a consistent style to them, we might need to use SVG. Um, that might actually make the most sense because we could inline SVG. Um, so that, I think we could maybe punt on solving that part and get like the mechanics of this thing working before yeah, we kind of go, go in the weeds. I would agree there. Um, okay, so just taking a look at what we're starting with, we've got the the helmet stuff what we're not really gonna use, the file system we're not really gonna use. Um, we're actually, I don't think we're gonna use any of the, the boilerplate that got set up. And um, that's good because that means that we don't have any, there's nothing to untangle here. It's all kind of decoupled from the work that we're gonna do. And if I'm remembering correctly, is our intention to put this widget like floating bottom right corner or do we want it to be kind of in line at the bottom of the page do you know any is there like a pattern for this that you prefer i envisioned it kind of living top right corner of the page Here? um but it could i mean i think the placement is something that will probably move around so i wouldn't worry about that too much but we we are um, imagining that this is going to be like a uh, i guess the the major question is is this going to be like absolutely positioned like a floating button or is it going to be in line somewhere? Uh, I think probably not in line. It's either at the top or the bottom and thinking through it at the top seems a little bit eager. Like when you're on a site and it's like, hi, can you take our survey? And you're like, wow, I just got here. Like, I don't want to fill out your freaking survey. Okay. So maybe at the bottom. Okay, cool. <laughs> that makes good sense. To me. Um, all right. So good. Then I guess what we can do is let's start by throwing this into, uh, we'll start with just a component. So this component 
I'm going to call it um, feedback widget. And I'm going to make it a folder because I want to be, uh, I, like, in all likelihood, this is going to end up being a collection of smaller components and maybe some logic. So this will help us kind of isolate that into one thing. So if we start here, we can import React from React, and then we can set up um, our feedback widget. Sorry, I had to fix your typo in the file name, and it created another file. Because <laughs> you were like ty typing. See, I don't know if you could see there's two tabs open now in the text editor. OK, all right, all right, OK. I fixed your um, spelling. There we go. So we're, we're using. Um, the VS Code live share thing. So um, Marcy is able to like jump in here and make changes. And at a certain point, she's going to kind of take over entirely. Uh, it's really cool if you haven't tried it. Um, Marcy, do you want to just like type something so people can see how it works? Because I think it's such a cool deal. Yeah, let me open up this file. Wow. Um, mine has like a cached edited version that's different than yours so i'm gonna there we go oh feedback got weird. widget me... here you go oh weird it got like all sorts of it weird. got really weird okay hold on let me fix here okay what do you see is it fixed for you yep that looks fixed okay um so to start this is going to be our feedback widget and so then we can take this and drop it into our layout. Was that prettier, just like automatically cleaning up your yes. formatting? Yeah. Okay. Um, it was all. So then if I come down here, what I should be able to do is in the main section, I'm going to put in the feedback widget. And what's cool is that it will auto import that for me, which is another like wonderful thing about. Uh, VS Code is it just like takes care of those things. So now that we've added it, it's also added it up here as a, an import. Um, and so if we look at this, what we should see is now we've got a feedback widget embedded in our code. And that's going to be true on page two as well. Um, so the nice thing is that now we can kind of play with this idea. And whatever we do with it, it's going to be um, present for us to, to kind of test and look at. So maybe the first thing that we want to do is start pulling across some of the, the general styles. Do you think just kind of thinking this through practically in, in both a uh, like best practices and also kind of a teaching capacity, should we hand code this stuff or do you want to copy paste things over from the prototype? I'd say you could just copy paste. I mean, we can walk through it and explain what's there. Um, I did code it by hand, but I, yeah, I think we can walk through it and explain what's in there. And that will be probably easier than watching me type radio button code. Okay. So let me pull out, I'm not going to take any of the script for now. Um, I think we're going to sense. end up kind of doing a lot of that stuff custom anyways. Um, and I'm going to wrap all of this in a react fragment. Is that so that you can like have a single parent then and not wrap it in an extra div or whatever? It, yeah, it's so you don't add junk to the um, to the DOM. And cool. You can probably get rid of that H1. Yeah, let's drop this one. The H1 would already be present on a page. So the widget, it's going to have a, a heading in the widget. So it doesn't need like an extra one. Yeah. What don't you like? What are you upset about? I think it might be missing an opening div or let's see. No, there's one there. Feedback widget. We've got, you could, you could collapse the form maybe and see if it's missing. Oh, uh, we're missing. Some. We're missing something. So there's um, a div wrapping. I think there might've been one more div at like, if you delete a div at the, at, no, no, that's right. So feedback success has its own. Okay, so this one, thing. that one's okay. The labels are okay. Everything inside of there should be fine because you copied it directly from the browser, right? So the browser will it's kind of automatically close things for you. Okay. Field set. We've 
got legend. And if you're not familiar with the field set tag, really great for forms. We'll look into it. Okay, so we've got a bunch of these that we're gonna have to switch over to class name. Let's see if that helps. We've got oh yeah. The inputs are these inputs are oh our inputs aren't self closing. That's gonna be part of the problem. Thank um, you, Chrome. <laughs> yeah. I actually thought of that and closed. I thought I think I closed most things because I was anticipating. So yeah, React or JSX, you have to put a closing slash on, on those self closing tags. Missing a oh, we didn't close the form. There. Text area, um, input, there we go. Sometimes the squiggly, you mess something up stuff, it like doesn't update for me. So BR, oh, there's a BR tag in there. Your comments, optional. Gotcha. Maybe I there it is. Hey, that right. was That was to get the text area and its visual label on separate lines. So, woo. All right, so, so now we have a completely unstyled um, widget. Should we, do you want to work on styling or functionality first? Probably a styling because that can affect the functionality. Um, okay. So let's, let's see. do this then. Let me add, um, because the, the site uses emotion, I'm going to use emotion which means that we need emotion core and emotion styled. And I think that's which it. I'm going to admit I'm, I'm new to emotion. <laughs> so I'm going to try not to throw too much shade on it. Um, mainly I'm, I'm going to have questions about how to, how to implement this so that it doesn't feel like everything is in line. Um, right. I know a lot of react devs love it. And so I'd like to kind of see how our, styles come together to make something that's maintainable and accessible. Um, yeah, I'm used to putting CSS in a separate file, at least for like a component. Sure. So we'll see, we'll see how this goes. So the, there are a handful <laughs> of ways that we can approach that. And I think that um, it's kind of like, it, it becomes a matter of taste, you know? So I know that like uh, a lot of React devs really love the, the inline CSS of, you know, you would just go in here and like type out CSS and and just like go to town. I don't I don't personally love that approach that much. Um, my my approach tends to be more in the like, let's actually define these as styled components. So one of the things that we can do is import styled from emotion styled, and then if we want to do a button, I can say like let's make this button styled. So I'm gonna do, uh, we'll call it the open button. And that's going to be a styled button. And in here, we can set whatever styles we want. So we'll make it display block. We will um, we'll have it be like background of Rebecca purple. We'll give it a color of white, which I think has high enough contrast. We can test that in the dev tools. Um, we will do, uh, let's do some padding. Um, we'll do like a border radius of, let's say like 0 0.5. And that's probably good enough to start. Um, this is, so this, you're gonna have to bear with me. I have this like weird thing about alphabetizing my CSS rules. And yes, I you're apologize. in good company. <laughs> All right. Okay, good, good, good. Um, so then what we should be able to do is just take this button and change it to open button. And in terms of styling, it's it's really similar, yeah. So it's really similar to the way that you would do um, like a separate CSS style sheet. We just kind of set it up with like this ends up being the class name. And the reason that this is cool and that this is useful is like we could theoretically put this into another file and then just import the open button. And our open button could have, you know, when we start getting into different functionality, we can kind of package up that button as like a it's a component that lives in a, in a separate file that has its styles and its functionality kind of encapsulated so that we could, in theory, publish it as a, a module and then import that into our, our project. And so the, the reusability, the portability tends to be kind of helpful. That um, seems really good for design systems. 
it's it's real. I think this is part of the reason that it's become so popular. Um, like the the thing about CSS in general is that like CSS is built on the cascade, and like the cascade is so powerful. The problem is, is that the cascade, unless you're unless everybody's building exactly the same CSS, the cascade requires context. Like you have to have contextual knowledge of where things are on a page and like how things are being fit inside of each other. And that tends to be really challenging at scale. Like when, when I was working at IBM, the problem that we kept running into was that the CSS people on like teams would, we had BEM style CSS that got packaged up and sent to people and they would get that. And then they would write specificity hacks to get over to get like overwrite styles. And then we would roll out changes and they'd be like, well, it doesn't work for us. And then we'd have to go debug their code and realize that they had done like a specificity hack. And so they had, they had unknowingly broken the cascade because they weren't super familiar with CSS. So the nice thing about the CSS and JS stuff is that it's encapsulated in scope to that one widget. So you can do like global specificity stuff, but the, the really the trade-off ends up being that like, you can import that widget that has all of its styles encapsulated, and then you can actually call styled on that again and apply overrides in line, and they kind of compose together. So it's a little more straightforward what's going on. So if you like import the updates and you're like, oh, it's supposed to be a different color, then you go look at your usage of it and you've got an inline color. It's like, oh, that's much clearer than my 5,000 line CSS file that's got all these kind of inline specificity hacks. So it's, it, it's more about, I think it's more about like, portability and communication and like low context communication than it is about actually the technology. Cause they're both equally powerful. They both accomplish the same things. It's just kind of like, how well can you communicate what you've done to somebody who has zero context on the code you've written? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, I wonder, yeah, it definitely makes sense. I'm thinking of an alternative for like the same function, not, not that we have to make this change, but just thinking through an alternative for teams. Like if you had a, CSS file per component that you imported, mm -hmm. like maybe that could kind of help you have, I don't know, not require as much context, um, but be able to like not have your CSS live in JavaScript. Yeah, Cause I, I know for some teams they might need that, um, you know, scalability possibilities, but like they want to write actual CSS. So yeah. that could work. I guess you would having scoped CSS would make that a lot easier. Cause I think, yeah, if your CSS isn't specific enough, there's so many ways that a cascade could do things that you didn't expect. Yeah. And so this is a really com like this would be a really common way to do that is, yeah. um, you know, you could, you can basically do something along these lines. Um, Where so you're importing a, a CSS file instead of using a motion. Yeah. So this, this would be like, Roughly the same approach. You've got a you've got a a div with a class name of foo. You're importing the the CSS file, and then your CSS file is is set here, um, and that can definitely work. Uh, but again, it kind of then you have these these questions where like, okay, so I've done this now. This is going to override any global styles that come in. So if you've got a global typography reset, um, and that's a good thing. That's what you want. The the catch comes in when somebody is like, oh, there's a global thing that I don't quite understand. And so outside of this, somebody's going to write like mm. this. So yeah, if you have, if you have foo p, yeah, you can, um, as, that will work if foo p is like specific enough to override every global paragraph tag. Yeah. And, and I mean, there are like, there are ups and downs to both of these approaches. This is super approachable to like juniors and, and outside contributors. Um, for, guess, or just I for guess, people who don't focus on JavaScript. Yeah, and I'm thinking through, I mean, wouldn't that be those same kind of like gotchas? Doesn't that still happen to you even in CSS and JS if you're importing a global style sheet? Um, typically, it, well, I mean, you can, yeah, if you do global styles, it can be, uh, like global styles tend to be the gotcha. Like if you yeah. if you are doing global styles, they they tend to get out of hand just because, you know, people have different use cases and they often fix global styles with global styles. Um, and so it, it kind of becomes the, 
the slow drift of intention over time is um, it's, it's just difficult to, to kind of keep that stuff in, in line. Um, so this is, you know, this, this is one approach where style components tend to encapsulate things a little bit more. Um, and, and actually there was a question a little bit ago about what the difference is between like emotion and styled components. Um, they kind of do the same thing. So like styled components is this approach, right? The, you, you have a styled component and that's, that's why, where it gets its name from. Emotion took a huge amount of influence from styled components. Um, the other thing that we could do if we wanted to is we could do something like this um, from Emotion Core. And then I could do like um, like warning styles. And that would be a CSS tag. Oops. And in here I could do like color red, right? And then in here I could apply those. Or if I wanted to, I could do it in here. And um, it would use that CSS. So this is something that Emotion can do that Styled Components, I don't believe, does. I think this comes from Glamour, I think, was the influence for this or, or something. I, it might be an Emotion original. I actually don't know the, the history. So of maybe if you, had, if you had like tokens, you know, colors that were like isolated somewhere else in your code base and then you could import them and apply them here is that mm -hmm. kind of the idea yeah you could you could definitely do that where you've got some kind of like global modifier styles that are encapsulated like this instead of being globally defined um and so you could then import like you know import warning from like global styles and then it would only be applied to the piece that it should be applied to and not as like a a global class or applied to you know all paragraphs or something like that um, that's, that's, a, another way to kind of atomize this stuff. Um, if you've ever used like tachyons or, or atomic CSS, I think the, the idea is sort of the same. You would be building like a, um, a cl a set of like really small styles that can be composed together. Um, I believe like Chris Biscardi has a lot of good thoughts on how to do this properly. Um, and Seems like you're, if you go that route, you're, you're pretty committed. <laughs> you like, are, yeah, I'm, well, I <laughs> you mean, better make is, sure it really works for your team before going that route. Yeah. I, I mean, if, if you're doing it that way, like the, the, the alternative though, is you end up with like the, like the MT 10, like FS 10 P one, you know, like the, these sorts of things is like, I don't actually know if these are correct, but like tachyons introduces this sort of of uh, class structure. And to me, this is, it's exactly the same thing. Um, and it would be similarly hard to back out of in, in terms of compositional styles. Um, and the thing that's confusing about this one is like with class names, if you've got two classes that set the color, if, uh, if you had like color purple and color red, um, looking at this visually, you would expect that color red would override because it's declared later, but it's actually not here. It's the order of the cascade. So wherever in the CSS files, color red is declared. So like if you're up here and you do uh, color red is the first one. Oops. And then here you have color purple. Wow, I can't type purple. Um, what would end up happening is that despite the fact that this one says color red last color purple, it would actually like this element would be purple. Um, so that's a little, it's a little counterintuitive. Whereas if you were, uh, composing color purple and color red from like, uh, the CSS stuff, the last added would be the one that wins. So it's a little more intuitively obvious. But, Makes sense. Yeah. There was another gotcha, um, that someone pointed out to me when using CSS and JS for accessibility, which is that the, so when you're using, I, I'm not really sure which tools it is, maybe it is a motion, but um, it will output like cached CSS names so that when you update it, you don't get this like flash of old styling or have to hard refresh to get it to update. Um, those CSS class names are pretty difficult to write a user style sheet, like say, 
say you have a vision impairment and you want to use a web application like your your banking site or something yes. you use a lot where if you could just override the styles a little bit, like force focus outlines or improve color contrast or whatever. Yeah, so that CSS dash whatever, those change a lot and mm -hmm. they are not exactly intuitive. So if somebody was creating a user style sheet and then you could use a browser extension or something to load it, having something like feedback trigger mm. is pretty con is pretty constant and it's a lot easier to like figure out. Um, so if you can, like if you're if you're writing a web application, it's good to have some sort of an identifier like that that's constant. Um, so, and I think Dustin was saying there's like another argument you can pass or something. That's what I was saying. I don't remember which tool well, it was. But. So you, you can, but it's still, so what that would do is it would change it from like this to like this, right? Oh. And so it wouldn't actually, it doesn't fix that problem. It doesn't um, fix the caching part. You'd have to like write selectors that are like, you know, ends with or something. Yeah. which yeah that's putting more work on the user right. yeah there, i mean just having be, a constant class there helps it th i mean honestly this seems like something that would have been brought up and if it hasn't we should do it but it seems like it would be relatively straightforward to um just have emotion output that name like constantly like a, a unique identifier um yeah because we're i don't know if it has been brought up um because we are providing unique identifiers. I guess they're not exactly unique, but unique-ish in that we are giving it a name in the It could be used it. for naming, yeah. Yeah, and so That'd I don't nice. know. Yeah, it seems like that would be something that could be generated like for accessibility so that you do get a, a constant name. For our purposes, we'll just, keep, we'll just keep adding a class name even if we're not using it. So we'll, we'll style using emotion but will still provide a class name even if it's not a style target so that if somebody wants to write a user style sheet they can sounds um, good okay so <laughs> that turned into kind of a, a like impromptu lesson on on emotion which i'm actually really into i thought that was fun but uh cool let's maybe keep styling and i think what we're gonna want to do is um so the widget itself is going to be. Yeah, we probably want to get rid of the so field set. And I think this might be why people don't use it more is that it has that default user agent style of the border. And for yeah. our purposes, we probably want to get rid of the border on the field set, maybe zero out padding and, and margins. And I think for the prototype, I had used display inline block for each label element, because that wraps the inputs and then they kind of sit next to each other. So field set, you could do border zero. Um, let's see, what else did I have? You wanted to do margin zero, padding zero. I had margin zero, zero, one M. So it would put a one M margin on the bottom of the box because there was a success, or no, there was the, the field set wraps the three uh, radio button inputs and their labels. And then they're outside of that field set. There was a text area. Um, so field set will group kind of related form inputs and it helps to just give you, you know, rather than using a random div, you can use something more semantic. Yeah. That and like semantics and the field are pretty much semantics are used. awesome. Yeah. You get so much for free and inside of the field set, you can use what's called a legend. Um, and that will actually expose what that grouping of form fields is for. So there's the legend. I've put an H2 heading inside of it mm -hmm. um, because headings are also a great way to navigate a page with a screen reader. And then what's, um, the, what's the tab index for here? Tab index will make sure that that heading will receive focus when we send focus to it. Um, and the, the negative one is so that you can't tab to it? Exactly. Yeah. So tab index of negative one means that something can be scriptable for focus, but if you tab through the page, you won't land on that heading. And that's because screen reader, um, screen reader commands, you can just hit the H key um, if you're in browse mode to get you through all the headings. Um, but we're actually using, we're going to use some JavaScript to send focus to it. Um, and voiceover and Safari are, are, at least lately for me, not working without that. So, okay. Cool. The tab index is nice. 
just so, to make sure. <laughs> so what I want to do here, because there's some duplicated code, like this, this label, span, um, and all this stuff, rather than having to write it out three times, I'm going to make this into a, a new component. So we will call this um, rating option. And we're going to import React from React. And we will uh, const rating option. And we're going to need some, some props on this. But uh, for now, let's just get this out. And then we will export default rating option. Um, and so what this will give us is the ability to import this in rating option. That's awesome. This is the part where I was like, yeah, this is fun in prototype land, but it's going to get faster to build in react because we can iterate over arrays and we can, I mean, you could just put three instances of it in there. That's probably the easiest. If it was like a collection from dynamic data, maybe we're loading it from JSON and we don't know how many items there will be or, or whatever your use case is, that's where building it with React, mm -hmm. um, I was excited for that part of it. And so here, um, like obviously right now, we're just duplicating the that hard-coded text. But so now with with these three items, we've, we've kind of eliminated a, a lot of duplicate code. And so to go back out and kind of think about what this means, we need to consider what our props would be. So there are a few things Whether, that we've got. This yep. Label. Um, so we want the emoji label. We want the emoji itself. And we may want to rethink that as we get a little bit further into it. Yeah, um, they could use images or SVGs yeah. or something. Yeah. And we want the actual rating. And then we want. We need to know if it's selected. Yep. Um, so that's going to default to false. No, I should know that actually. Um, and then let's see. So the type, the name. Type, of... type is constant. The name is constant because that's what groups yeah. the three together so that it's one unit for all three of them and you can only pick one. Right. Um, this is, is not. I mean, you could you could make that configurable, but it's going to be the same for all three of them. Right. And, and if we were going to like make this into something that was going to be used in multiple places, we would probably do that. But in this particular instance, like we're not. And so I, I don't like to add a lot of config before you actually need that config because it leads to like options that no one ever uses. And then you have to support forever. Um, yeah, then, exactly. Do these ID, ideas... we, we could probably dynamically calculate that so the value was basically something to pass back like with the form data when you submit right. it because an emoji is like not useful <laughs> it's an it's an image it's like it's it's label is literally frowning face in this mm -hmm. case so not super useful for like data analysis yeah um you have rating and value i would think those could be the same um, rating and value well the rating is the text the text. Oh, okay. Uh, let me make that more clear. The rating. So there's text. like a there's like a numeric rating value, um, which we can use for both the value of the input and we can like dynamically add it to a string for the ID. Yeah. So we'll use the rating value to build the the ID. So let's um, let's take this out and let's add these options. So I've got all of these, and I'm going to come in here. And let's build out our our uh, first one. So we've got our emoji frowning label face. is hmm. frowning <laughs> face. Our actual emoji, this is probably not going to be scalable, but I'm going to do it anyways um, <laughs> for now. And we'll fix that when the time, like once we hit a problem, we'll, we'll deal with it. I think we'll, I think we also need to use different emoji anyways, just because I, I think that's going to hit like weird encoding errors. Um, the rating For sure. Text, yeah, I mean, we saw it on my prototype, so I'm sure. The rating value was one and it's not selected. And I don't know why I'm adding commas because we don't need those in props. So, <laughs> um, all right. So we've got these and then 
Yeah, I had the middle one selected by default, I think, um, just okay. because then it's like you're starting from a neutral place instead of a, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, that's. Yeah, We're so hoping cool. that it's not all bad feedback. Like maybe <laughs> you're just like, meh, it's fine, but it would be better if you added this thing. So it's, what did, yeah, we said, be a, we said uh, poor. Neutral, oh. I think, or okay. What did I put? You had you had something that made sense, and now everything that I'm thinking in my head doesn't make fine. Fine, it's fine. Fine, it's <laughs> fine. Okay. Which, when I uh, lived abroad, hey, hearing the weather described as fine was always really funny to me. <laughs> it's fine, which actually in Australia meant it was great. <laughs> was it smiling face? Smiling face, yeah. Happy face, smiling and face. Are we like I had the stars? I that's probably not. We do like sunglasses emoji, just like a smiley face. A heart eyes is my standby. <laughs> you could do sunglasses; that'd be fine. Or heart eyes. Uh, let's like. do let's do sunglasses because I think uh, that's. Oh no, we should just do a smiley face. We'll just do a regular smiley face. <laughs> um, I don't. <laughs> can always change it later. Yeah, uh, we'll do three, and that one is not selected. Okay. So we've got all of that. Oh, I could have just looked down here to see all of this. Um, okay, so we've got all of that. I'm gonna get rid of this. So now we've got a nice simplified rating option set up. Um, but as we'll notice, nothing is happening yet because we're not using those props. So let's go use them. And we'll do that by emoji label. And the actual emoji reading text. Uh, we need the rating value. And then here we will do. Love template strings. They're awesome. They're definitely helpful. So yeah, that should give us the right stuff, poor, nice. fine, great. Um, and then if we tab, we're able to do it, although it's not showing our selected because I didn't apply that. So we need to do selected equals selected. And that should fix this. So now, nope, it's not fixing it. I think selected was a CSS class. So it might need to do class name and then an, like a ternary. Uh, but it should definitely. But that but would just I apply said, an attribute, wouldn't it? Or a prop. Yeah, so this, this applies a prop. And when you do that, it should be true, which should. But it's, not in a, but it's not in a CSS class, right? So this is like, if you had a selected attribute, I think we need a CSS class name Wait, that is applied. But for a radio button, don't you, don't you supply selected or? Oh it? yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Um, yeah, it should be an HTML, HTML attribute. Um, it's a boolean attribute, so maybe. Yeah, this should be like that. Should set it to true. Um, let's look and see what. It should know, render it one. Doing. Yeah, I was confused yes. with my my label class was throwing me off. Um. It's not setting Go to your console. Maybe there's an error. Oh, we're also setting this, which we shouldn't be. Um, yeah, console tab oh. index. Oh. Well, it doesn't like the all lowercase tab index, which is funny because the browser will end up changing that anyway. I know. It's like, okay, JSX. <laughs> JSX is. I'll make you like, happy. It's got a couple weird hangups that I really don't understand around that. Oh, um, I think there's more, more than one in there, maybe. There it is. Okay, let's try that. Okay, it's still not taking it. So let's uh, consult the docs. React selected radio. When in doubt, look it up. And we want. I feel like a friend asked me this recently. 
So there's checked and selected. It's checked, I think. Now I'm thinking back to what I did before. Uh, um, we're going to have to put state into this anyways, but, oh, it is checked. You are absolutely correct. So let's switch that over to checked. I threw you off because I had that label class of selected. That's, yeah. I'm also just in general kind of bad at, um, all right, let's see. So it our, is checked. Yep. Yeah. But why is that one showing up? As, I think selected is for selects. Um, aha, here we go. We got it. So checked. Woo. It's working as expected. Good, good, good. Um, and so we're going to need to hold, uh, hold it in state which means that we can play with some React hooks. So let's Ooh. grab out, <laughs> use state, and we will turn this into a regular return. And then up here we can do const um, checked, set checked, and that's going to be use state. And let's set the value to just the, the value that we want. Um, oh, wait. Mm. We want some kind of a, a better identifier here. I guess we could do like, How would we want to do that? Oh, for managing the state? Yeah. Because, yeah, something that implements all three of these radio buttons needs to know which one is selected. Um, I guess it could be like checked is like checked equals one. I don't, I don't love that, but I guess that's OK. Um, this feels gross. I mean, yeah, maybe there's a better way to do that. Um, semantically, that makes sense to me. I mean, there's three rating yeah. values. It doesn't seem super scalable because we're using rating numbers and maybe there's some other system that we have to hook into. But yeah. I, think if it, I think if it moves us forward right now, we can always come back to it. Yeah, I think it's, it's probably okay for the moment. So um, then what we would want to do is... Um, we need to set an on change. Is it on change? Yes, I believe so. I think they have in here, there. So we can check. And then do they have an on? Where was the? Yeah, it, on, on, each ra on each radio, I had a change event. That's the, well, at least that's the native DOM version. Okay, so const handle change is going to be uh, an event and that will set checked to event target um, value. And I believe just do on change equals handle change. And if we drop these in, then what happens? Okay, we're getting console errors. So I did something wrong provided a checked prop to a form field without an on change handler. Read only, I did set an on change. Set either on change. Uh, d did you put it in all three of them? I did. And now I'm wondering, did I do something stupid where like these are supposed to be? No, they don't have to be, aren't they labeled? The names they are labeled. Am I supposed to put it on? Like 
This is the they all, thing, right? And they all have a name. Well, the on change was I was Googling something when you implemented it in the component. Maybe go look at the radio option, rating option. So the on change needs to go on the input. It was in oh, the uh, yeah okay. So I added it as a as, as a, prop. a prop, and then I didn't actually use it. It didn't actually make it to the DOM element, which is why it's complaining at you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Better? No. It's still not loving it. Okay. <laughs> what gives? Um, yeah. What gives? Did you refresh it? Because I found that it keeps old error messages I mean, around. I thought I did. Um, I'm handling the change. On change. Maybe I, change. May, maybe what I need to do, this is this might be like a reserved. Um, let me set handle change. And then in here, I'm going to change this one to handle change. And that means that I need to change it up here as well. So let's try that. We didn't get an error or anything. Let me refresh. Yeah, it's still giving you that, huh? Wait, are you preserving the log? You sneaky... Okay. <laughs> False alarm, everyone. Okay. Um, it's all oh, good. But something is failing. So what's failing? Let's look at the on change and start logging things. So you tell me what the value of checked is, and then tell me what the event is. I'm such a nerd, but I love this kind of stuff, like inspecting the event object and seeing, like being able to use DOM native stuff, like form events is awesome. Okay, Check. so it is updating things properly. So checked is one, right? And, and so this is a synthetic event, which is like a special react Mm -hmm. thing that'll it which it, what's cool about it is it'll handle event delegation for you so less risk of memory leaks because it's like attaching and detaching things for you as your dom changes but it can get complicated <laughs> obviously yeah so checked equals two is it is it a string versus a number it didn't look like it, but maybe let's uh, let's go back. Go back to what you logged, because you're doing a strict equality check. So let's do a type of check, and we will. It says it's a number. Number. Okay. Checked. Hmm. Checked. Let's go in here and check what the value is that it's giving us. So the on change function is working because it's emoting something when you right. click on when you click on those, it's just not matching the right value. Right. So what does it think it is? Checked. So what do you think? Let's Okay, so it says check, check, check. Okay. Now they're all false. So the true oh, one yeah, isn't yes. working. Okay, so I'm going to just log like checked, and then I'm going to console log checked equals two, right? And so what we should see is that when I click this, it'll say false. String, but string. Wait, is it going no. from string to number? Oh, you sneaky. Okay. Ooh, did I call it? <laughs> I think you got it. You got it. So let's uh, cast that's this funny. to a... That, no, I'm making things up. That's not how that works. Okay, back to the console. Um, if I do... I love the console. This is how I debug. That's what's yeah, funny that's about live funny. streaming is like, we're normally having to debug, you know, to fix stuff. It's just, you're seeing it like how we actually have to do it. Not uh, the, Marcy, you got it. <laughs> yeah. Not getting it perfectly right on the first try. Well, I'm glad that that worked out. 
Okay, so let's go clean up this disaster that I created. <laughs> um, cool. Okay, so we've got that. We've got this. We can drop that. And now we have a working radio toggle, and it is keyboard navigable. So Woo. this is great. And we didn't this have to great. manage that at all. That's just that we got that for free, which I it's will tell you in accessibility, use the free stuff. Yes. It will help you. Um, I love it, like I love when Dustin gets on the stream because so uh, for for anybody watching, Dustin Shaw is one of our coworkers, and he's like um, he's the Gatsby God. He is the Gatsby God, and uh, <laughs> he like has the most helpful nature of anybody that I've ever met. And so um, I love it because he's like always in the stream, and he's he the stream has like a, a few seconds delay. And so it's consistently like me struggling and then Dustin offers an answer, but because of the delay, it's immediately after we, get, we get it worked out. Um, so, <laughs> so thank you, Dustin. I really appreciate your help. Um, oh, did he have an answer? Yeah, and we were he, like he was fumbling we around use parse int, um, which would have been equally helpful. Like we, so parse int would, would parse the number with a value as an integer. Um, and number just like explicitly casts it to an integer. Um, all right, so let's style this thing up a little bit. Let's make it look nice. We're going to do the rating options are going to uh, also be styled components. So let's import styled from emotion styled. And then I'm going to set this up where we've got a handful of things going here. So we've got the emoji itself which we want to have certain styles. We have which is wrapped in a, it's wrapped in a span to give us a little more of a handle around it so we can mm -hmm. label it. Um, if it was an image, we could put an ARIA roll of presentation on it or whatever we need to do so it's not just like a raw graphic or yeah. so let's, Unicode thing. So we're gonna set this up as a styled label. And then for this one, we're gonna do display inline block block and to make sure that that works let's set a little bit of margin on it and we'll set a border of one pixel solid light gray okay so we can take that let's do this check it and there we go. So we've got our, our labels are now a little separated. That's good. And nice. we will. So there's two spans in there, one wrapping the emoji and one wrapping what I called the level. And that was like the text label for an emoji. So we're not relying on somebody to know what an emoji, like I, we, I wanted to add a little bit of text there. So you're not having to like parse in your mind of like, what does this mean? And it might seem intuitive to a lot of people, but just explicitly putting a text label sometimes can clear up any kind of confusion. Yeah. Um, and, and that so was those actually two... one of the reasons why I didn't want to use like the hard eyes or the, uh, the sunglasses and stuff is like, you know, like a, a big smile is, is pretty obvious. I'm happy as opposed to like sunglasses are just like, I'm cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm cool, man. Um, yeah, so the two spans, um, I had put display block. I think I increased the font size of the emoji to make it really big. And then when I focused on the input, it would like make it grow a little bit. Um, so you could use font size if it's an actual like glyph or something. If it's mm -hmm. an image, we might need to do transform or something. I think I did a little bit of transform on the focus actually. Rating text is styled uh, span, and we'll make that uh, also display block. And let's do. Um, I think uh, I had half an M, 0.5, and made it bold. Uh, how do we? I guess yeah. And then font weight bold um and so i i always do like this is kind of a oh, i gotta actually use it um the wow stop helping okay uh <laughs> th there's kind of like uh, there are a couple ways to approach sizing especially text sizing in um in css 
And so the approach that, that Marcy has been using is to use like the EM and the approach that I use is the, the REM. Um, mm. I don't know that like you could make a lot of very philosophical arguments for why one is, is better or worse than the other. I, my experience has been that I like to set on the body a textile and then make everything relative to that. And that's what REMs do. Um, that is totally personal preference. So <laughs> I'd say go for it. Yeah. I saw a talk. Gosh, who is that from some CSS wizard um, where they, yeah, you just change the font size on the body and then everything changes or change a color on the body and everything changes. It's so magical. So yeah, do that. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to also set a little bit of top margin here. And then, so the thing that I wanted to try that I think will be cool is um, I'm going to, I want to know why this is blown out of the box. So let's two big solid red. This is my standard, like my go-to debugging here is to figure out what's going on. Um, so for some reason, these emoji are bigger than um, the actual text would be. So like, is that because the line height needs to be one? It is. So um, I can set the, the line height to one, which will fix it. I could also like just force the height. Like if I didn't do this, I could do height uh, 100 pixels. It's clearly like, you know, we, we could screw with that. But I like using the line height. So let's do the line height of one. Um, that feels right. Go maybe, no, nah, we want one. Yep, one is what we want. So I'm going to set that line height of one. And then I want to try, uh, I want to do a, um, like we want a focus thing. And we also want a... Um, you wanted to try and hide those radios, right? Yeah. So the first thing that we can do is like for selected, we can do something like, this which is pretty cool where um i can take the props how does this work uh there are a couple ways we can approach this and i think the one that i'm going to use is if it's selected now nah, let's let's not get into like wacky things so i'm gonna do just a class right like a straight up class and to make it easy we're gonna go Two pixels red. That's um, cool. Can you? You're using SAS type syntax in line. Yeah, it's it's really nice. And so that's pretty awesome. I'm going to do this. We'll do checked, and or uh, we'll do selected or null. And what should happen is that as we so there's two stateful things we should probably clarify. And the reason why I had checked and selected, maybe selected wasn't the right name, but so there's the idea of focusing on something and That's then nice. whether whether it's actually activated. So there's kind of two different things. Um, so yeah, focused. Yeah. yeah but, that, that's probably a better is, way. Focused is what we want. So, but it's not working the way that I want it to. So I'm getting this this focus, so, but yeah, it might be my class. So, do you, did you have a focused class? I think I missed that. Wow. There's um, a lot of, uh, interesting I, style that gets <laughs> just like injected into the DOM there. Yeah. So this is the way that emotion rolls is it, it kind of sets these up. Now we're in development. So it's basically just appending things as we play with them in, uh, oh, I see. in the production world, it, like, packages stuff up and get smaller and, and all those good things. Um, cool. But I want to know why this is being attached to a different thing and it should be attached to. So, okay. So which one is that, which node had that CSS class on it? The emoji. Oh, they all, they oh, all yeah. have the, Oh, <laughs> you applied it to the emoji. That's right. Not this the is label. Just me being bad at code. Um, all right. So let's try that again. All right. So now there go. when it is selected, it'll turn red. And then the other thing that I wanted to do was um, we want to do 
like when the option is focused, we want to do something that's like, cause we want, we want to show focus, but we also want to show selection. Um, or I guess it doesn't matter in this case because they're, you can't like focus without selecting. Is that right? Because we have a selected one by default, if you didn't, um, you would have to hit the space bar to select. So I think in this case, yeah, it is kind of the same. Okay. So I think because we I have mean, a default, like, yeah, okay, yeah. maybe <laughs> to, to cut down on complexity, we want to just not, not deal with focus since we've got a selection. Yeah, that sounds fine. I think that might have been a carryover from my custom component where it wasn't like automatically selecting when you would arrow through. Um, but I think for this case, we're leveraging the native radio button inputs. Okay. So that's fine. So I'm going to uh, do a little bit more over here to make this look nice. Uh, now I need to remember the alphabet. Does P come before or after T? Elemental P. This is literally how I work. <laughs> um, I'll do that. <laughs> Let's set a border radius of uh, 0.25. And that should give us a little bit nicer looking deal. That's a little closer to your original feedback widget. Um, Which is completely, we can ditch those styles. Don't need to keep them like that. Let's play with. See that is funny how you talk out loud about how you remember the alphabet, because I'm sure I'm doing that in my head, but I just don't say it out loud. <laughs> Because <laughs> I also alphabetize my CSS. Let's do this. Um, let's actually just set like a kind of a light color. And I'm going to set this as a slightly darker color. And that should look pretty good. That looks okay. And then I'm going to... Um, maybe the perp maybe the Rebecca purple instead of the red. That's what I was thinking. And then we can do the background as Rebecca purple as well. And the reason I'm keeping the border is so that we don't get size, like size jump. Um, size jank. Size oh, jank. Oh, and selected, Oops, we should probably change color. the text color to white. So we get proper contrast. And I don't know if people know, but Rebecca purple, isn't that Eric Meyer's daughter? They named that after her. They did, so yeah. I love that we're using Rebecca purple. Okay, so we've got a like, somewhat styled setup. Let's try hiding this um, radio button. Yes, so this should be a fun challenge. I would recommend starting with, yeah, position relative on that. If we do an opacity of zero on the input and give it a position of absolute, it should pull it out of the flow. Um, and I say opacity because we want it to actually render so that it will be part of the, the accessibility of the page um, in what's called the accessibility tree. It also needs to, we need to be able to focus on it. We just don't necessarily need to see that we are on that input because we can style things around it to show focus. Okay, so if I switch that, so effectively what we've done is we've, we've made it so that you can't see it um, You'll see then, other things. By moving it to position absolute and like setting a top and left, we're just taking it out of the flow of the document. So it's in, right, right now before I save, it's occupying space. And so if we made it like if we made the opacity zero, we would have this kind of empty space here. So by making it position absolute and going uh, up to the top left, we remove this space that it's occupying. So theoretically speaking, we should see that. So that's what we want. Um, I mean, it's still not perfect. Like I want, mm, we need to show I think, focused. I think we do need a focus outline if, um, yeah, let's see. So this so, would be really easy if we could use focus within because what we'd be able to do is um, focus within and we would be able to do like border fix solid red and that's gonna look Let's do yellow because that'll be more noticeable. Um, it's going to look atrocious, but check this out. So we'll have <laughs> um, see how it uh, actually that's really hard to see. Let me change that to a different color. Um, I wish we could just mimic the default, which is that blue outline. It's not always the default. Like Firefox has this single pixel dotted thing. So um, 
just to, to kind of demonstrate, I made it real ugly. So we've got, um, we've, I'm focused in the, the text area down here, which is the blue outline that, uh, that Marcy was just talking about. But if I tab back, now we can see that we're focused. And then if I tab out, we can see that we're not. Let me see if I can just apply that outline. Um, apply default focus outline. I don't think you can. You can use like outline. Uh, yeah, getting a hold of the default style, you can't really. That's like the user agent, maybe, but it's not going to match in Firefox um, or oh. even Edge, I think. So, so it's like yeah. you can make it match in Chrome and Safari on OS X, but it's not necessarily going to match everywhere. Um, which is why focus can be difficult. That does remind me why focus is, uh, why the outline is cool though, because remember how it was jumping. Um, mm -hmm. So if you use outline. it Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't jump. mess up the box. Yep, less and I jank. I think I can even. You could add, add a border radius, yeah. And I know we can probably use a polyfill for focus within to, mm. to expand support. Did I break that? Why does that not work? Scroll back down, border radius. Oh, wait, is Maybe. that like an outline border radius? Outline, oh, I don't know. Outline radius, wouldn't that be cool? Box um, shadow. Hmm, maybe not. Um, outline uh, does not get the attention it deserves. Clearly does not. Let's so let's do this. Let's do a box shadow, and we'll have zero offset. Um, we'll make it a, and we won't have it even. So this is the x offset. This is the y offset. This is the like blur, and then this is the size. And so what I believe will happen here is when we focus, I've broken it entirely. Oh, because there's no solid is why that broke. So yeah, there we go. Now we, so that's like, it's kind of janky. It's not really what we wanted, but it's, it shows very clearly what's being focused. And if I, if I set it to like blue, that's probably going to look, oh, that's rough. Light blue. <laughs> <sighs> I don't like any of those. Yeah, um, we can play with it. I mean, we might need to introduce a custom focus style for this widget. And as long as it stands out, I think that's fine. We're not doing, we're not overriding the custom focus outline on Gatsby. Um, it's, it becomes hard to manage. So I think as long as this widget is visible, it has good contrast. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't match the rest, I think that's okay. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to play with this text a little bit because it's just very, it's kind of hard to read. Oh, it's um, a little small, yeah. So I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger. I have a special guest. Oh, she ran away. The cat was like about to call my lap. She's like, only if you don't touch me or acknowledge my presence. And I'm just gonna set it to sans serif because we're ultimately gonna use the, the Gatsby stuff, but that should make it a little easier to read. Um, yeah, that works. Okay, so now we've got kind of a, a good little good little widget set up here. Um, let's style this uh, this text area. And let's do that with I think we can, yeah, we can just do here. Do like a constant of uh, text area label. It's going to be styled label. And then we're also going to have a text area, which is going to be a styled text area. And this label will make display block so that we can get rid of that um, breakdown there. Oh yeah, that text sounds good. Label, we'll drop this, and then we'll make this text area is also going to be display block. And we'll set- So the text area label- Is already display block. 
Well, that's what that break tag was in there for. So the, the text area label wasn't actually wrapped by itself. So they're, Wait. I guess if the text area itself has display block, then right. that should yes. render on the next line. Okay. Yeah. Just thinking the, that through. <laughs> okay. So that actually that should mean that if I take this and I, I'll just make it like red or something so we can see that it's working. And so it's red. This is display block now, which is good. Um, let's apply some basic setup to this feedback widget. So let's create feedback widget, or I guess we'll call it like widget wrapper. Cause I think, um, that is going to be a div. Is there a more semantic element than a div for this? Would it be like an aside or something? Depends where it's applied. Aside, tapping into my accessibility knowledge here, aside is supposed to be a top level landmark. So not contained in a main, which really surprised me because thinking back to WordPress days, like your aside was usually like buried in your main content somewhere. Oh, no, it's actually supposed to be top level. Wrong. So sitting next to it. And we don't really know where this is gonna be embedded, so. No, yeah, you're right. Okay, so div it is then. Um, so let's take this div, we'll make the wrapper, it's gonna be display block, we want it to be, um, we'll give it like a, let's let's give it like a mobile friendly only style. So it's gonna be like cool. 300 pixels. Um, we will give it padding of, well, let's give it one REM, um, maybe a border of what was that color I used D's nice gray and a border radius of let's go with a 0.5 and I think I think that'll probably be enough to at least let us see what we're working with um, and I'm gonna keep now we need the ID right because that was or we don't need an ID but we want to keep a class name because that's how we're gonna get the um, uh, allow people to do the, the user agent user style sheets. sheets. Yeah. Having a class name gives you a little more of a hook. If you were writing user styles, um, for, for some folks, like that's how they can use a web application or something that has pitiful accessibility as they can override it in the user style sheet. Mm. So yeah, that, that sounds good. Okay. So I've got, this uh, this button feedback widget inside the so, widget. So I was hiding and showing the feedback widget with the hidden CSS. It's an HTML attribute that will match display none. Um, so you don't have to write a custom style. Can't really animate display none. So maybe we could just do that for a V1 to get this thing working. And then later, if we wanted to animate, we might need to use visibility hidden or animate like set display none on the last keyframe of an animation or or something like that yeah i think um probably just in the interest of of not of um, time <laughs> yeah because I, I think this is already running the risk of going pretty long so let's um people have things to do equals show widget if i can spell For, yeah there you go <laughs> and on this we will say on click, we can event prevent default, and then we will set show widget to true. What just happened? Okay, so I'm getting- um, It's not hidden by default, so. I don't, or no, we did, you did add a hidden. Hidden is a Boolean attribute. Show widget, set show widget to true. Show widget by default is false. And that should mean. Maybe you could go check and see if the hidden attribute, I guess if it was rendering, it would be hiding the feedback widget. That is not working. Okay. So let's try, oh, oh, I know what happened. I got it backwards because my naming is stupid. Um, 
we're going to call this hide widget because no no that's right though it'll be hidden by default it's hidden by default we're going to set hide widget to false and that way down here when we say is it hidden it's actually lined up. We want it to be hidden true. So hidden is hide widget. I was doing it backward is the problem. So we were, um, that's just me again, doing this all very confusingly. Um, Did you hit so, save? <laughs> oh, but look, no, it's still, so now it's, oh, it's hidden, there. Oh, your it's CSS is more specific. Interesting. Oh, okay. So that's okay because we can fix that's that. That's a div. Yeah, that didn't need display block to be set on it because it was a div. Ha ha. So divs are blocked by default. We don't need to override that, but interesting. Okay, we have. We have a we're, widget. We're getting there. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, let's take this even a little bit further. I'm going to take this and I want this to be Let's see, we need like an actual set of things. Or, no, I guess we don't. We can do a, we can do a position absolute. And I'm gonna set this at the bottom right. And that should drop that down where? Where did it go? Oh, why did it do relative? Oh, I, hmm. That's bizarre. The feedback widget div, I think, had had display relative, or position relative, sorry. That should the, be. Like, does main or here? maybe the default starter has some styles on it. Or maybe it is, how is that graphic rendered? Is that a background image or an inline uh, it's like a image tag? Image. Are things being applied here? So you're trying to position that at the bottom of the page? Yeah, although I guess we could just like, do we want this to, um, we could set it to instead of position absolute, position sticky, is that the one we want? Oh, <laughs> cool. Um, I forget about how, how cool that one is, but that's not the one I wanted. I actually want it fixed. So now we've got we go. a fixed element, but we've got Z index issues. So um, we can solve that, I believe, by just setting something like this. I think you could just set one. You don't even need. Well, we're. Are we going to set, are we going to set the feedback widget? How is the, the feedback widget position? So Where is that going to go? What I was going to do is this. I was going to do position fixed, and then I can set it to be um, bottom, uh, whatever the height of this is. And I, I we're going to have to change this a little bit, but we could do kind of the 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 margin, which is or the bottom offset, which is one rem plus the height of the button plus another rem. So we could do like. Um, and we could even, we could even if we wanted to like get super nerdy and calculate this. So two rem plus 57 pixels, which is silly, but let's do it anyways. And Magic numbers. Then, Where did that 57 come from? That's the, the browser height of this button is 57 pixels. Oh, I see. Yeah, I, we're not gonna keep that. I just kind of want to show how this is gonna work. So we'll have our thingy set here, we need to set a background color on it. Background color of white, and we will also set a Z index of two on this one. Okay, so that's what we want. It should be nice. hidden though. Yeah, why isn't that hidden? Uh, it was just because we hadn't uh, refreshed the page and we don't have mm. a way to like toggle it closed. So now if I click that, it'll open our, our feedback widget. So that is nice. what we want. I think we probably want to make this a little bit less um, obtrusive. So let's play with this in the browser a bit. 
So I want this to be could probably be smaller. A little bit smaller. So we can do maybe like an 0 0.25. We might need a close button as well. Or yeah, and was, wire up the escape key. If you're like, mm, I don't really want to use this, you can hit the escape key. I was <laughs> send I you was back to the button. Same. Um and then should we try to make this like less? Do we do we want to make that less uh why make it a yeah you could reduce the font size potentially how small can we realistically make this like if i make this 14 pixels that seems that's legible mm -hmm. okay yeah and i assume we're probably gonna have some design review on this later so i wouldn't yeah. worry about it the pixel perfection too much right now What's the, eh, let's, yeah, let's just do sensor it. Um, okay, and then I'm going to also add a little bit more here. And that should That looks be, good. Yeah, that's, that's legible. It's also, I'm noticing it's got this goofy little border on it that you can only kind of see. So I'm going to set a border of none. You could also do, what is it, WebKit dash webkit dash appearance none and then on ios devices it won't get those like platform style changes that you don't expect oh, cool i don't i've never used that one i probably should okay so that gives us kind of some basic things we could put a little bit of box shadow on it or something we'll do like a one pixel one pixel uh maybe two pixels and I usually do three, 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 like a dark gray. Okay. You could do a light gray. There you go. And then we can even set, uh, have you used the, the alpha channel on this? So you can set it to be like. Transparent. Yeah. Wow. Like cool. Really transparent. Hexadecimal with alpha channel. Super yeah. cool. It's pretty, pretty cool. Okay. So let's make that a little bit darker so we can actually see it. Um, And then a little bit bigger, bigger. <laughs> um, okay, that's probably too much. That's fine. This sort of looks like it's got a little bit of dimensionality, but not much. And I broke it. What did I break? Why don't you like it? Maybe it doesn't One, like two, the alpha channel. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight is what I broke. Oh, wrong number of numbers. And so it's like visible, but not super visible. Um, and I think that's okay. So let's. It's okay for now. Yeah, it's good. It's good enough. Um, or as I learned to say when I lived in Montana, close enough for horseshoes and hand grenades. So um, let's go font size. I'm so sorry that I have to do this. <laughs> it's okay. My OCD Why agrees. Damn thing. Okay. Wait, so you have border none and then a border up top looked I like. It, I put it oh. on the wrong thing. I'm just, oh. I'm just being foolish. Uh, okay. Font size. It's not how the alphabet works. Got the border <laughs> of none. Goes up here. And the box shadow. That's going to go up here. And I don't know where that should actually be indexed, so I'm just going to leave it down there. I usually put it at the end because it's prefixed with WebKit, and it starts with a W. <laughs> and I, did I do it on the wrong thing again? Like, what's what gives? What it, what were you noticing? Oh, it changed. Yeah, it didn't take any of my... Oh, I changed the padding is why that... And... Cool. That's our actual our actual thing. Um, we can now lower this. How tall is this? It's thirty. So we'll just I don't don't love it. Let's let's try just like four. Run. How does that look? That looks good enough. Um, okay. So we've got that. We've got ourselves a a floating feedback widget. If you click it, it opens a feedback thingy. Um, and then we 
can click through or we can tab through. Good, but uh, importantly, right now, if I tab to this and I hit enter, it will let me tab in, but it's not gonna announce that we're in there. So should we um, do that focus thing? Yes, we should. Um, I sort of think of this as a non-modal dialogue, so we're not gonna block. It's not like an alert or modal dialogue where like you have to keep the user from like from interacting with anything else. This is more of a non-modal dialogue so that if you open it, either you click elsewhere on the screen or hit the escape key to get out, but you can still interact with other things. Right. Um, so whether we actually use dialogue semantics is kind of debatable. Um, I think we can get pretty far with focus management. So what I did in the prototype was when you clicked on the button, it would open the widget using CSS and it would send your focus to that heading, mm -hmm. um, which is rate your experience. Um, and I think it's inside of the legend. So it'll get you into the general spot so that then your next tab would get you to the form control, um, the, the radio buttons. Yes. So we, we could send focus to the heading, maybe use a ref. I mean, we're in a single component, so I don't, I mean, do you need a ref for that? That's usually like to give you a reference on some far off component elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so the, it, my, my dirty little react secret is I don't actually know how to use refs. Um, I've you haven't been used, doing much focus manager. I've like never used that says a to ref. Me. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. They're okay, really yeah. great. Um, I mean, they started off not recommending them strangely, but then I think for focus management, it's gotten so useful that they added more of an API around it. So you can, you know, create a ref. Okay. It is really useful when you have multiple components and you need to like send focus around. Um, there is a proposal to make more React y, like an API for managing focus, but that's sort of an aside. Um, yeah. So you can, you can create a ref and it just, instead of having to go find a DOM node and send focus to it manually, you can kind of do it in a more React type way. Didn't they create um, like a use ref? It was a, oh, did they? There's they a totally hook for did. that? Yeah. Oh, awesome. I haven't actually seen that. Okay. Use so ref. What we should be able to do is. Nice. There you go. With the focus management this. example. And then we're going to set this. Okay, so let's just let's just use this exactly the way we want it to. Um, nice. We're going to import use ref. Super cool. And then I'm going to get just a thing. So um, we'll call it the widget title is use ref, and don't need to tell it to do anything. So on change, we're going to say widget. Well, title that's that's when the focus. I think that might be the wrong spot. So that's that when is, the radio buttons are changing. We want yes. it when the widget opens. Okay, that is correct. So let's move this one out to be an actual helper for legibility here. Um, and then put this back down, handle open. And then I've got, we're gonna hide the widget and we will focus on the widget title. And that means that we then need to apply that ref to our title. So widget title, is it gonna be that easy? That would be, Real cool. Did I break it? Oh no, it's just because I added a hook on the hot reload. Okay, so all thing it like if this goes well, I'm gonna hit the enter key right now, and we're gonna be focused on that um, that heading. So let's try it. Oh. oh. <laughs> okay. So let's. <laughs> it didn't work. Let's uh, um, let's try something else. So you've got the ref on the heading. And yes. that should, where does widget title, can you scroll up? I was oh, yeah. not paying close enough attention. So here's widget title, which comes in from the use ref. And then we're saying widget title 
current focus? It might be a timing issue. Um, sometimes if the element that you're ex like changing the display of, which we're using the hidden attribute, it could be a timing issue and that the widget hasn't completely finished its render cycle to become visible, but we're sending focus to it. Mm. Um, sometimes that's as simple as just waiting a tick with a set timeout. It's really hacky. Um, it didn't actually do that in my prototype, but we have much more complexity going on with React using, and we're using state and stuff like that. So we could at least validate whether that is the problem by waiting, like, I don't know, two milliseconds or yeah, even right. just like just the default the loop usually works. It's just the event loop. Yeah. And yeah. if you're not familiar with the event loop, um, there's a really great talk called what the heck is the event loop anyway, um, from JS Conf a few years ago. Yes. It was it. So the event loop hadn't quite, it's like you have to tell it to wait a tick with focus management, um, which is why a React API for this would be pretty awesome. I wonder if that's, that's kind of gross. That is kind of gross. And I wonder if we could. Hmm. I mean, I remember with set state, there was like a callback that you could use. Um, hooks are sort of new to me. So you, I would think I use ref. I guess you, the ref doesn't know that it's being called or changed right. and it's like the thing that's causing this is completely unrelated to the ref um the element that the ref is in isn't visible and like when we're trying to call focus on it yeah and so it seems like what's happening is it's uh when this becomes visible that should yeah hmm i don't know this might actually be Maybe this is just the way that you do it. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're waiting until the event loop like completes its thing. Um, where this can get trickier is in tests. Like if you had tests that you needed to assert focus. Yeah. Um, if there's any kind of animation, it can make this much worse. So um, I'm wondering, maybe, so maybe what we should do is like, we know this is going to work. Um, follow up. Whoa, set state callback. Is that a thing? Because that would be cool. Um, let's go up to set state. And let's look at it. Set state. Or use state, yeah. Do we get a set state callback? There used to be, yeah, that's how I used to use it when I would be calling set state in line is there was a callback function. Um, I seem to remember that didn't always work for me, like especially if the thing you're changing the display of has any kind of animation that would add an additional delay. Um, right. Yeah, there's an example. So set state has a callback use. I don't know if use state does though. Yeah, cause this, well like we're, this is use state, right? So you would be getting your um, your set state from here. From use so state, yep. We could do something in here, but that's not gonna, I don't think that would fix the, um, oh wait, we're being told that there is a an example in use ref. So if we would have just continued re reading the docs, apparently we would have found <laughs> a solution. So let's- It's a tiny uh, browser window, Jason. You can't see I the know, whole thing. it's hard. Um, okay, so we've got this. Use ref. Value. Keeping any mutable value around. Callback ref. Okay, so use callback. What? Okay, so the measured ref. Use callback, it gets a node, and then... So that, how does that work? Is it like polling for changes? Like, or does that run once? Because I don't know if that it will actually like solve our problem. It would run whenever this array changes. So we could... So we could make our ref dependent on like some sort of style change on the feedback widget? Yeah, let's 
see. That doesn't call that change between the re renders. Won't call it unnecessarily. Hmm. Maybe what. I don't get it. Rectangle. I think that one was making something reusable um, depend. It was like a, yeah, using get bounding client rect. I mean, that's looking for height. We're looking for display or the hidden attribute being there or not. Yeah. Um, so I think like, it seems like what we would want is because if I'm understanding this correctly, the way that this works, is um, this would like execute on this ref once. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if maybe what, yeah. It's like, will the element be in the correct state when that runs? That's why I was asking, like, is it continually yeah. pulling until it's, that condition is true? Or is it going to be the same problem, just okay. in a fancier package? So I'm going to try <laughs> one thing that I that may be a terrible idea, but um, use effects. Uh, Harlan W just suggested this, and I think this might be what we want. Um, we would want if there is a thing that happens, and the thing that we would want to check is whether or not the um, the widget is hidden. So whenever that changes, we would want to check if hide widget is false, then we would want to do a widget title current focus. And so then if I pull this out, what we would want, what I, what I would expect to happen here is that this is effectively our use timeout. So let's try that and see if it does what we want. So I'm gonna come out here. And if that works, that seems like a much more reactive way to do it. Yes, nice. Okay, so boom. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Harlan W. <laughs> yeah, I, I really appreciate that, that assist there. Um, Use effect is exactly what we needed, and that is Garrett. Get that that timeout out of there. <laughs> get <laughs> that out is a of win. Here. Okay, um, perfect. Nice. No, that's great. All right, so that's that. That's actually super exciting. Um, that looks so much cleaner too. Like anytime you're introducing set timeout is a bad idea, but we didn't always have the right tools to pull this off before. Mm -hmm. Where you're, you know, that internally the framework can give you an assist. I feel I think like that it, works better. It's stuff like this that like really shows how powerful this new hooks paradigm is. Um, yeah. Cause it's like, you know, when you kind of look at use state, you're like, I kind of, like I sort of get it, but I don't really get it. Um, like it's, it's the same. Yeah. As using, it's the same as using state. Uh, but when you get into the, the effects and like the, the simplicity of using refs, um, I feel like that was way easier than what I looked at with like the class based components. And the other thing that I really like about it is that it's all, it gets like, if I zoom out a little bit, all of our logic kind of gets contained up here in this this one chunk. And then yeah. we I saw in the docs that it suggested using a reducer and that would just make it so complicated. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is much simpler. And yeah, it keeps the logic right in the component where it should be instead of in like a higher order wrapper component or something. Um, I, I found that to be very confusing when you're, you know, you have your component and then you have this other wrapper thing for um, sure. yeah for people new to react and, and redux that can get very confusing i yeah i totally agree um I'm, I'm just curious is this legible for everybody if i make it a little bit smaller because i just i i realize like it's kind of hard to see what the hell's going on in this code at the with the the font that high so um if it's well not, you know you you can always just say out loud what, <laughs> what you're typing and that helps I, yeah, I definitely could do that. Um, so if, if this isn't legible for you, please, uh, please let me know in the chat so that I can make it bigger, but I'm going to roll with it like this for a little bit and we'll see how that, uh, how that helps. So then the next thing that we need to do is just kind of finish out the styling for this, um, comment thing. 
And the reason that I started with the, the widget itself is just because I wanted to be able to make this like a hundred pixels wide and I want to give it a margin on the bottom. Oh yeah. Good call. So we'll do like, I think we've been using that D color. Um, so we'll do a margin of one. How's that look? Okay. We're getting closer. Um, I'm going to leave the default styling because I feel like it gets a little funky if we start messing with it too much. I'm going to take the color off of that. I'm going to instead make it bold. Font weight. Font weight. weight. Okay. Um, and I'm going to set that size a little bit smaller. Font size will do 0.875. Much better. Does right. it matter that that one is a serif font and the H2 is not? I yeah, that's... I feel like maybe that should be set higher on the widget so we don't have to... Over like, you could change it in one place. Yeah, you're 100% correct there. So let me take it off of... Let's see the widget. That right said, there. sometimes form controls are like, I don't care what you set. <laughs> you have to override them anyway. That can happen. This looks okay. Um, yeah, that does look okay. I think the default for some of those is sans serif. It's really just the headings and label text. Okay, so now we have regular text. I think we're in pretty good shape here. Um, this this light blue is like kind of sort of growing on me. I know it's terrible, but <laughs> I'm like, I, I don't really know what to, I, I'm a little at a loss of, of what else we should we do. Can, here, so. um, we can always work on that later. I think one point is that it's not a super high contrast between the, the, like the focus outline and the background color, but it's also that purple on white, which is like, <laughs> what do you get that will be, have a proper contrast over both of those colors? Um, so we could probably punt on that until yeah. a little later. Okay. Yeah. We'll just, we'll, for now, we'll just kind of leave that, leave that be. Um, if we need to, we can come back and, and figure out a way to make that more. Uh, I guess we could do like white with a purple border and then make the border thicker on selection or make it, so I, uh, let's just not worry about it. It's, it's fine. It's we can play we can play with it later. Um, I think functionally some things that we're going to want. I mean, you could style that submit button. Um, yeah. We're also going to want we're going to need a way to close this thing. Mm -hmm. So probably a close button. Um, I think at the very least for this exercise, we could just bind the escape key for like a shortcut escape yes. key. And then you'd send focus back to the button that you triggered it from. Um, that's a good thing to show people how to do just so that, I mean, it's such a convention to be able to hit the escape key and, and close out of things that so when it doesn't do that, you miss it. How would, uh, how would, how would one do that? So I, I sort of know, like I've done key binding before, but I've actually never done like the escape key to close. Yes. Um, so we will need to bind a key down event. Okay. There's key down and key press, and they have slightly different um, options, but key down should be fine. I think we probably want it, yeah, and maybe in the widget wrapper, and then that will bubble through. Like if you're focused anywhere in the widget wrapper, it will it will be listening for that. So on key down, that will fire for any key. Uh, reminds me of the Homer thing where he's like, press any key. Where's the any key? <laughs> um, so we want to look for a specific event key code. And the one that I used, let me go back to my prototype. Oh, I don't think I used escape actually. Um, or did I? Key down. I think it's 27 event dot key code and it's camel case key code. Um, you can yeah, also yeah. use event.witch. I think there's like differing opinions of which ones you should use. I just use key code. Maybe there's a better way to do it, but you can just check for an event value. Is escape event. Event.key code. And it's a capital C. 
like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then if is escape, we will set hide widget to true. And then we want to send focus back to the button where it came from. Because if you're really a keyboard user and you can't like then go grab your mouse or your trackpad, you want to be put back in the correct spot and not just kind of like left hanging. Okay, so then. Ooh, fast. So, so then what we'll do is we'll set another ref and we'll say open button. And the open button is going to be this one. Mm-hmm. Of open button. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And so then on our use effect, if the widget title is false, we're going to focus the widget title. If it's not, we will focus the open button dot current dot focus. As long as that doesn't happen on page load when that widget is set to be hidden. That's the only thing I would want to make sure that. Oh, yeah. OK, let's try it and see what happens. We don't want that button stealing focus on page load. That would be kind of a pain. OK, where did the focus go? I think if you just, yeah, that looks fine. So if I reload. I think the, the, the button would have a focus outline if, if it was doing that. So it's okay. probably fine. And then if you hit escape, yeah, cool. nice. Look how ergonomic right. that is. That's really that's amazing. Nice. You just open it and close it. OK, um, yep. that's, that is very slick. Uh, and let's maybe just for, for the sake of completeness, um, for those of us who don't typically know how that sort of thing works, we can do like a href close. And on click, we will handle close. I think it should probably be a button. If it's not navigating you somewhere. Okay. No, that's that totally makes sense. Um, let's do that. And we could, yeah, you could just put the word close in there. Yeah. That's probably the easiest. I mean, if we add like a, yeah, the X, we might want to wrap that in aria hidden or something so that like only the actual word close is announced in a screen reader. So, oh, so that. Um, so the times, if you just wrap that in a span, then we can like, we can hide it. If you do aria it, dash hidden of true, that will, that text will then be treated as like, it will ignore it. So you could wrap just the, just the times, what is that, Unicode or? HTML entity. H an HTML entity, yes. Okay. So in doing that, I have a close button that cool. doesn't work. Okay. And why not? Because it's checking for handle close if if it's doing the escape key. Yeah. Um, so if it's escape or it's firing when you click on that button. Usually what I'll do is I'll have like a event handler for a button and it might decorate, like it would call that like set hide widget, um, but with slightly different, like it, oh, it's a button, like, it's a button click instead of a handle, um, an escape key. Got you. Um, so it would be like, like handle escape key would do the key code stuff and then yeah. it would call the close button, maybe pass it argument if that close function needed more information about. Yeah, exactly. And then the handle close will do the more agnostic closing of things. Gotcha. Yeah, that seems to make a lot of sense. So then I can swap this one out for our escape key. Okay, and if I save this, what I'm hoping will happen is that if I hit the escape key, let's reload. Okay, that still works. And now Ooh. our close button Ooh. works. Nice. Okay, 
So Sweet. let's make that close button. I want to make um, this button and this button look a little bit nicer. So to do that, I'm going to uh, add, let's see, submit button is a styled button. That one is going to get um, the WebKit appearance of none. It's going to get a border radius of 0.25. It's going to get a background color of Rebecca purple. We'll do a regular color of white. And I imagine you'd probably have some sort of like button base that all buttons would just totally. pull in or something like that. Yeah, I mean, th this is kind of one of those cases where what we could do is um, we could take, like, all of this. The stuff minus being fixed. Yeah, so let's take all of this, and we will do a button styles equals CSS. And we'll drop out the fixed stuff. Okay, and then I need to import from Emotion. CSS from Emotion Core. So then I can drop all of this except the fixed stuff. And I can do button styles. And I can do the same cool. thing down here. Doesn't that feel nicer? <laughs> then, if I apply this, oh. And little fun fact: the um, the like submit buttons do not need labels because they automatically come with text. So, do I want this to be an input or a button? It can be either. Um, you could do button type submit. Um, there's also button type button. So the close button would probably be a button type button. Um, you can either use so inputs a... or buttons within the context of a form. You can use either. Okay. So you had it as an input. Should I just keep it as an input or do you? You could do button type submit. I think that'd be fine. Then you can reuse the styles a little more easily. Um, we're just going to have the two different types. So we'll have a submit and a close. Oh, no. We might, oh, you know what? I Well, I was just saying input type submit didn't need a label. A button now will need text inside of it because it's- A button will need text inside of it, okay. It works slightly differently than an input. So input will give you text for free. Submit button needs the word submit. Um, for the close button, we can do a little bit of work on that one too. Yeah, there you go. And the close button, I actually just want it to look like a regular link because I don't think we want to give a lot of like focus or attention to it. So well, one thing I was going to say is that we should give it a little more of a specific uh, word to describe it. So it just says close in there right now. I'll, we can wait until you're done with styling. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that totally makes sense. So, so it's like close what? <laughs> yeah, fair. Um, so let's grab those styles, but then I'm going to override some things. So I'm going to make the background transparent. I'm going to make the color blue and we'll do text decoration underline. Oh, um, you're making it look like a link. And we can, uh, that seems <laughs> fine. Um, and we'll do close button. So what you could do, um, if we just want to use that X, you could wrap that close this widget text in a span and then we can visually hide that. Um, or you could leave it there, I guess. That is a interesting <laughs> link button thing. Generally, we try to say like, make links look like links and buttons look like buttons. Um, well, so my, so here's my thinking is that the, the, this is like, a utility thing, not a thing that we want people to think is a form input. And so mm -hmm. making it a button makes it look like it's part of the form. Um, and so I wanted, oh, to, I, see. I wanted it to look like not that, like something that you would just click. Although now see, but now I'm see, and this is the problem. Like now I'm hacking, right? So I don't know. Cursor. 
So now it like behaves like a link, um, which is probably not what we want. I mean, it's like, it's fine, but it's, uh, it is definitely like we're hacking at this point. I was going to say you could just have a button with like an X and put it in the top right corner or even the bottom right corner would work. And then we can okay. hide the te we can hide the text visually um, so that it still renders, but it will. Um, so like if you go up to the close button, drop that down to another line, wrap it in a span. Um, I don't think we have, we haven't written any CSS in here for visually hiding, but um, I think on Gatsby docs, it might be a class called SR only for screen reader only. Let me go look. I'm gonna have to go digging to find it, um, but we can, we just need to add some CSS. Yeah, I, and I think if we just look like that should be applied to, I think we've got like a jump, like a menu jump. Um, mm -hmm. So I believe. Which I think comes from reach. Um, there's like a reach skip link thing. Skip to um, main content. So that oh, CSS that is probably about. handled by reach. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of where I saw it. I know it's on the plugins page. If you go to that. Let's go to the plugins page. And you might need to be in a, at a bigger size, like, like bigger viewport, sorry. Um, I don't know how that new plugin tagline rotator renders on mobile. There you go. So those buttons, the, the little previous and next, there's a plugin for that. Those should have thought they did. SR only. Maybe no. SVG. I thought there was text on. Oh, I think I may have oh, just labeled is. those. There totally on. is, but that text is. Oh, it's like a. Okay, so I think what I'm remembering seeing was in the source. It was like a variable for SR only, and then it's rendering out to this. Uh, I, I gotcha. like hack cached CSS names class names. Yeah, um, so I'm probably just going to like hack that out a little bit because we'll want to use what's in the um, what's in the in site the code. But for now, we can we can just do this and we will drop it in if I can spell, and that should close this. Give us our, I oh know. Oh, Did we it's, lose I, it? it's, oh it's on everything, not on the span. Um, close button text. Styled span. span. And we'll drop that. Spans are your friend for this kind of thing because they're a semantically neutral element that's a good styling hook. It's display in line by default. So that's why we use spans. Where did I break? I think it just needed a reload. Oh, maybe not. Close button text, class oh, name. Um, I know what I did. Oh, it has a typo. Haha. -ha. Okay. But it still works, so. Cool. Okay. Good. Well, we can play. We can play with that later. Um, mm -hmm. Sort of debatable whether it should have an X at this point, <laughs> but we don't need a bike shed on the button. The functionality is there. I think the other piece that we need to do is like a thanks for submitting screen, and I think there is markup in the widget already for that. So I think that's yes, it's that clear. and and actually hitting an API are like the two things that we have left to do. Yeah. Um, and so the hitting of an API, let's see, it's coming up on noon. How's your, how's your meeting calendar looking today? I'm clear until one. I am also clear until one. All right, let's see how far we can get in an hour. Um, we may have to do the, the API part uh, later. But well, so the success stuff would be kind of like when you're returning from the, the API callback, right? Mm-hmm. But so you could do, do it in that order. We could do like a submit 
So we can do like a submit thing and skip the part where we actually send it. Um, mm -hmm. And then like display as if it had submitted properly. So for That's now, true. just kind of like yeah. console log the, the result. So let's do that because I think that'll be, that'll be good. And then we're going to want the text area to be a controlled input. So we'll start by doing that. We're going to do the checked comment set comment. And that's going to be use state and we'll start as an empty string. I can't, cannot spell today. And the value of this text area is going to be comment and the on change will be handle um, comment change. What is the handle comment stuff going to do? Just like keeping track of what the user typed? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we're going to have it do like right now we've got this handle change. We're going to do const handle comment change. Um, and the reason that we're doing this is because we want to do, um, we, we want to be able to submit the value of the form and we don't want to have to write custom JavaScript for this. So React does controlled components, which makes it a little bit easier and it, it keeps the value of these, of the, the form inputs in state so that when we go to submit, we can just grab the state values instead of having to like serialize the form or, or do something custom. Um, so what we will do is set comment to event target value. We're also going to need to sanitize this because we're taking user input and we're not going to want to yes. just send arbitrary stuff. So for security purposes, we should probably sanitize what? that. <laughs> yeah, the, yep, that's a, that's a good call. Um, what would we want to do? So let's, let's set some, some text. Um, is I mean, what we really, we want to avoid, you know, inline scripts, um, HTML, probably not. So even, yeah. I mean, from a simple standpoint, just like changing open and close angle brackets into their HTML entities, or I don't know, I, I using a library is usually a, the way I would approach this is to make sure that like, I don't know, I'm using code that's already thinking of all the edge cases that people can do. This is like the little Bobby Tables security problem where like you could, you know, escape out of a, an expected command and then add whatever malicious code you want after that. Mm. Let's see if somebody's got something here. Um, Stack Overflow, always good for the quick answer. Sanitized it's sanitized by, by default. default. So that might be a slightly different use case. We're taking user input. Um, well, I mean, it's so I guess what uh, what that means is that like if I so actually let's let's just look at this for a minute and then we'll we'll play with it. So what should happen here, assuming I did this right, is if I come down here and I start typing. Um, what we will see is, let me just console log the, um, what is it, comment. So as I start typing, it goes in. So if I do like something like that, um, it comes in. So unless we actually, it's, so this is basically sanitized input in terms of what the, like what would be sent. So unless our database parsed things, um, it would, it wouldn't really be an issue. Like we probably want to dump that kind of garbage just to make sure that we don't get ourselves into too much trouble. So we could do something like, like let's take this. And if we were to do a, um, I mean, you probably want something on the client side and on the server side, to be honest. I mean, because you could, I mean, a, a sneaky developer could like go change the value of it or I don't know, you could do some really hacky stuff on the client side. So you would also need some sort of server validation. Yeah, so we do like this. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> I don't know. 
That looks like a pretty gross this... uh, regex. Yeah, what did that even do? Well, that's Took out to... the... So that's supposed to drop anything that's not a word character. This... So what we want is we want just the, like, the the actual like code things. So I don't like if somebody tries to copy paste a bunch of code into this input, I don't really care if we can read it, right? Like, I, so I just want to no. strip out any, any dangerous characters. So what yeah. I'm attempting to do is pull out any, oh, I forgot to make it a, a set is why. So any non, non word is the slash capital W, non space is the slash capital S and non digit is the slash capital D. So if I run this, what should happen is it should keep everything except the angle brackets. <laughs> it just got rid of everything. Okay. Didn't work. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've used a library called strip tags. So you could just strip HTML tags out of it. And then all it would leave you is like text and potentially, you know, the body of a malicious script, but not the script tag that it would need to like actually execute. Um, yeah, because I think what you would want is for the H1 tags to just go away and get the get the plain text. Right, and so that sort of does it, but it, it whacks all of the spaces. What is strip tags a? It's a library. Um, I guess I was using it in my Gatsby site in my build, so we need something on the client side so that when the user is typing in i mean the, the api backend is also going to need some validation i would ex i would expect um that's what i was saying like a sneaky web developer could probably hack a, a form submission on the client side so you kind of yeah. need both yeah um i mean and, and again like what we're what we're really planning to do with this is is uh you know we're at the at the outset at least it's going to go into a table and never get like red um and we're going to end up kind of just looking at the, the plain text. So there's not a lot of a, like you'd have to be pretty clever to get, like I can't think of an actual attack. <laughs> People are like, clever, Jason. You I know, I would always, I, know. I would just ex like plan for the worst, you know? Um, we could also like add a to-do to like make this more production ready a little yeah, later. I think that's, that's probably good. So like if we do something all I really want is to just get rid of any non, I guess this is fine. Um, like, what does this do? Let's try it. So what I was just doing here, did I lose my thing? If I get rid of this and drop that in, yeah, that's that's pretty close. I mean, it it's still not gonna strip like. If I do, actually, it probably will. So if I do something like this, it's like alert, evil. What happens? Yeah, I mean, that's like good enough, it right? Looks, it looks decent for a V one. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not like, we're not going to win any security awards, but it's um, it's probably... <laughs> it's a good probably, start, let's yeah. put it that way. It's so a better start than just taking unsanitized user input. You could add a to-do to, like, check up on its robustness and a look at the back-end sanitization. Okay, so we'll do that. Um, call it safe comment and how about that? So what should happen then is that if I go in here and start doing evil shenanigans, I'll just drop them right out as I'm typing. So we could hack this, but I think it would be challenging and ultimately probably not particularly lucrative to attempt to hack a static website. <laughs> um, 
but teaching no, moments, think, Jason. Teaching no, you're, moments. You're absolutely correct. This is, <laughs> this is definitely not something that we would want. Like, we, we don't want that kind of junk in here. So let's, um, we, we've got that. That's good. So then the next thing what we want to do is um, we want to handle the submit. So let's handle submit. Which benefit of using a, an actual form here is that if you hit the enter key in that text area, it should just submit. Well, which not is like the, when, it's a it's a text area, so the text areas are multi-line. But if we go oh, here and if you go it, there, yeah. yeah, or if you're on or if you're on the radio button, maybe. Yeah, so we can do. Yeah, I guess for an input type text, if you hit the enter key, it would work. I just always miss that when people forget that step, you know, and I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm done typing this in. Why can't I hit the enter key? Yeah, that is definitely, um, that's not, that's a pain. So we've got the, the checked and the comment. And so we can say the rating is going to be checked. We should change that. That's, that is not a useful yeah, the handle change also it could be like radio change, um, set rating. And then I want to look for checked. Whoops. I want to find checked. I don't need to console log. Oh, wait, we already. Yeah, all right, I know what we're doing now. Um, so that was here. <laughs> and then we're going to do rating and rating. If you, if you do uh, on a Mac command D, you can highlight all of the instances of. Yeah, the, the problem is that we pick text. these ones up. Oh yeah, those are the ones that the actual DOM element needs. Yep, so, okay, cool. So if the rating is three, then we're gonna check this element. That makes a little more sense to my brain. Yeah, um, yep. So then we've got on our submission, we're going to put out the rating and we're going to put out the comment. And I think that's all we need. And then we will do something like um, actually submit form. And the other thing we need to do is show thank you uh, view. So right now, if I come out does here. It, does it matter if the comment is empty? Shouldn't. Okay, so I broke a thing. Oh, because I didn't actually set it to to use the handle submit. So let's go up here. We've got a handle submit function. And I'm gonna come down to my form and say on submit, we're gonna handle submit. So now if I cool. come in here and I just submit, no changes, we've got a rating of two and an empty comment. So that's what we want. Cool. If I add more stuff, and I change the rating, we get our Sweet. rating in our comment. So that's good. So we wanna show this, um, this submission. And I think the way that we can do that is more state. So let's do, um, const is submitted, set is submitted, and that's going to be a use state of false. So on submission, we're going to set is submitted to true. And what we want to do then is this should be, oh, and then we would also want to set the hide widget to true. Okay, and so then down here, we can say is submitted does not equal true. Okay, I think what that'll do then is if we refresh go here and submit. Oh, on okay. submit, were we closing? So we Oh, I saw the dismiss button. 
Yeah, that's that's so basically we haven't styled it up yet. Um, we yeah. we're probably going to want like a, a slightly different setup here. But so we've got it where we open it, we submit it. It hides our rating uh -huh. and shows us our, our deal here. Cool. But what we're going to want is for this widget wrapper to go around everything. Well, widget wrapper has its own hiding going on. So I guess, yeah, you could put it on the form. The form does wrap everything that's relevant. So if we put it on the form and then come down here and move this out here, then if Okay, so that's this is right. This is what we want. So we, mm. so we're gonna want this to also have a little bit of setting. Or let's see, hidden is gonna be um, hide. Well, that adds like a third level of hiding. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. Sure. I mean, what you needed to do was we just need to take some of the styles from that widget wrapper and apply them to the like feedback success part. So you, you just want it to be like two separate things. That's it yeah, could that's, be. Yeah, I mean, you're probably right. Then you don't have to manage a third level of hiding. It's like kind of unnecessary complexity. It's really like the feedback success and the feedback widget are siblings. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's like which one is shown. It depends on your interaction. Yeah, you're right. That's you're right. Okay, so less to, less to manage at least. And that's going to be a style div. And what are the common components here? Um, I believe all of them. Mm -hmm. So if I take this and I move it out into um, widget styles. Then I can take this and replace it with widget styles. I feel like I could have just reused my widget wrapper, huh? Probably. Yeah, I definitely could have. So we've got yeah, I mean, it doesn't really have any extra you are, yep. behavior. I mean, we want the escape key probably. Um, it's got a dismissed button in there. And, and otherwise, it's just a heading and some paragraph text to tell you, we got it. Thank you. OK, so let's go back here. We're going to take this, change it to feedback success. I'm going to keep this piece of logic here. Um, if the is submitted does not equal false, we want to show that. Um, cool. You can and, probably get rid of that div. Yeah. And change this to a widget wrapper. So we are going to have one problem, which is that this handle escape key um, is going to be like, it's, need to it think. thinks it's still the first part of the state. Well, it's going to change the other thing. So I guess what we could do is just make it a global reset. So handle close is going to be um, set is submitted to false as well. And then what that should do is just kind of give us a general reset whenever we use it. So then if I'm here, didn't work. Um, we oh, we didn't do any we didn't do anything to the dismiss button yet, I don't think. Yeah, but it definitely That was the that was the escape key version, right? Yeah. That escape key should have worked though because we've got feedback Oh, did you Oh, did you hit the escape key? And I hit escape while I was focused on this dismiss button, which should have Oh. Up. And Yeah. 
gotten rid of that. So what did I do wrong? We've got the handle escape key. Let's click up to this. Um, I'm going to just console log that it's happening. Mm -hmm. And let's, okay, so I'm in it. Okay, I'm hitting escape and it's not doing the thing that we want. Hmm, so, so your state probably doesn't match up with expectations. And it's so a set hide is, widget. Set is submitted to false. Okay. And you down here, hidden equals, yep, you're right. Okay, so then if I go through, I submit, it shows it. Okay. Nice. So we didn't focus within though, because I think what'll happen is if I try this, if I submit it and then just hit escape, we're not in the way. Mm. So we would want to focus on this again, right? Yeah, we want to send it to that thanks for your feedback okay. heading. So we can. Success title, and we will do a another use effect. This feels a little duplicative, but um, is submitted, and if is submitted is true. We're going to take the success title and focus on it. Otherwise, we are going to go to the open button. Okay. I don't love that we basically just copy pasted everything, but I think that's... Maybe there's a more elegant way to do that. I think we can make incremental progress and that's fine. Ooh. Whoa. Where success did that just happen? Title. Hmm. Is there a ref on that? I, I missed that part. Well, so I just, I hit enter, tab through. I'm going to hit enter. I think it was trying to focus on the success title, but it doesn't know what that is, maybe. Um, Did I typo that? I'm not success sure. Title. Success title. Oh, and then if you go. Didn't, I know what happened. We didn't actually set the ref. Oh, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay, let's try that one more time. It's like, I don't know where you're trying to put focus, buddy. There we go. Okay, I hit escape and now I'm back on the feedback widget. Nice. Success. Okay. Um, now what? We have how many minutes? It's only 1220 right now. We, we blazed through that. So I think uh, right. the API, making some sort of an API call is probably what we would want to do. Okay, so this is going to be fun because the way this is gonna work is we're going to open up the API. All right, so Gatsby has an API. If you've, uh, if you've ever used our swag store, um, we have an API that like, once you log in, it will, come on buddy. log in and once you log in my network is clearly under a lot of stress here because we're streaming and everything streaming um so once i get logged in it's going to fire me back over to the store and over here we're making an api call to figure out which coupon codes my github account qualifies for and so we can see like that they qualify and it's also doing a bunch of stuff like it's looking up my um my contribution count and it's like binding these coupon codes. So like, it's okay for me to show these because they're, they get explicitly safe listed for a GitHub user account. Um, so you have to like qualify in order to use these, these coupon codes. So there's a whole bunch of stuff happening under the hood. The nice thing about this is that we have already built a ton of logic here, which means that we should be able to come in and just build like another thing for it. And the thing that I want to build 
is going to start here, I think. That's not it. That's not what I want at all. I want the Prisma data model. So right now we have a contributor type. I want to do a feedback type. So we're going to do feedback, and that feedback is going to come with an ID, and an ID needs to be unique. Um, we're using Prisma under the hood, and Prisma has a couple things that are, are kind of specific to it. One of them is that this uh, unique decorator or directive can be used to, um, to specify that something is or is not uh, required to be unique. So ID needs to be unique, and then the rating is going to be a, a number, so we can just set that as an integer. It is required, and the um, comment is going to be a string, and that is not required. And the, the lack of an exclamation point is what makes that not required. Um, so then inside of here, what we want to do is figure out how all of that is actually going to function. So all of this. So this is our public schema. And we have queries so we can load our contributor information. We can load, or this one's deprecated. So we can get, get a contributor's info, or we can get open issues um, by label. We aren't actually going to do anything for querying the ratings. We just want to like put them in. So we're going to create a mutation instead. And the mutations that we have are to create a contributor or to update a contributor. We're going to add a new one, which is um, submit feedback. And that is going to take input. And that input is going to be um, feedback widget input. And it will return, what should it return? Probably just like a, a status. Um, let's have it return a string for now and we'll make that required. So then down here we can define what our input type looks like. And our input type is going to be the rating. That's an integer and it's required. The comment, that is a string and it's not required. Um, oh, I need to give it. If they do anything with the ID or is that kind of handled under the hood? The ID will be automatically generated by Prisma, which is kind of a nice, a nice thing. Cool. Um, and then in our resolvers, I want to, let's get away from the query. Let's look at the mutations. And so like, here's kind of the, the logic that starts happening. You get your query and this is the, the input that's gonna come in um, and then we can do stuff with it. So in this case, we like figure out which discount code somebody's earned and add tags to their Shopify customer and all sorts of stuff. So for ours, we can do, um, what did I call it? Submit feedback. We're just gonna submit feedback and that is going to be, I don't think it needs to be async, but uh, let's cross that bridge when we come to it. So then that's gonna give us our input because the argument that we're providing is named input. And we will be able to then do some stuff with it. Um, for now, let's just log what the input is that we get. So I'm gonna take that, I'm going to What's that first argument with the underscore? So the original GraphQL spec specified a root field and it was used for like passing, actually, you know what? I don't even know what it was used for. I, I read that it was used for like passing extra values around, but now there's a, a convention where you instead get a context, um, a context argument, which we're not using and context would have any extra values in it. And then you also get an info argument. And that's just how the GraphQL spec is designed. Um, and since you don't use this one, but we can't break backward compatibility, you end up just like not using it. So uh, the underscore is a way to signify to ESLint that we're not using 
it, it like prevents getting an error. Cause if I put in root, it would then start complaining at me that I had an unused variable. Or, this, or this if you problem. didn't put anything there, that would probably complain too. Well, if I, if I didn't put anything here, it would not work because it would then yeah. try to read this out of root. Um, which I think is one of the arguments in favor of destructuring is that if you change up your arguments, it's just now you've got a, a named argument that isn't ever used. Um, the downside is that they're not self-documenting like positional arguments or I don't know, there's good and bad reasons for all that stuff. So um, anyways, this is now uh, mostly ready to rock. So the thing that we need to do, if I remember correctly, let's see, we're not gonna do any deployment here. I'm going to instead come out here. Let's go to uh, dev, Gatsby API, hey, hey. Um, and then I'm gonna do Prisma Generate. Doing a lot of stuff off of memory that I, I haven't worked on the API in a little while now. So um, what I want this to do is, let's see, it did what I wanted. And so now if I look at the generated Prisma client, what we should see if I look at submit feedback, I don't know. Oh wait, this just pulls in all those models. So I actually want to look at the schema. And what was that command to the API doing? Um, so Prisma uses this data model that we created. And then like Prisma is basically an ORM, uh, which I don't even know what ORM stands for. It's like object relational model. I might be making stuff up. Um, but an ORM is, a, is like a tool that's used to make interfacing with a database easier. And what that means for us is that we get to say something like, I wanna have a feedback type. In Prisma, we'll do things like um, in here, we can do create contributor. If I go to the declaration of this, we import Prisma up at the top. And then wherever we find Prisma, I can just like grab this contributor info or cool. I can, um, yeah, there was create contributor. So I can like do prisma.create contributor and just drop in data and it's gonna do it for me so that I don't have to actually write all the database interactions. And it does this by kind of abstracting, like we've got database action at the lower level and we don't, we don't want people to be able to just directly go to the database because that would be chaos. Um, cause you have your, you have read and write and delete permissions. Like we don't want that. So instead we have to write kind of an intermediate layer. Um, our schema is the intermediate layer. And then we selectively choose what people can do. Um, and in our server, like we require, uh, an access token and stuff. So we are like checking for a valid, uh, JSON web token in order to make calls to this. So we're gonna have to, that part I'm gonna do not on a stream because there's a whole bunch of like secrets and tokens and things that I just uh, don't wanna risk accidentally showing on screen. Broadcast um, to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it basically that part is, we're gonna make, make it so that when you submit from the doc site, there is a uh, some kind of authentication token that lets the server know that it is in fact allowed to get submissions from our site. Um, and that will, that'll keep somebody who wants, to, like if somebody was being silly, they could, uh, they could just spam us with a bunch of like nonsense feedback. Um, and that actually makes me think we need to know more than just the rating in the comment. We also need to know where it came from. So sure. we want to know what, like the origin URL, um, do we need to know anything else? Like that's it, right? I mean, sometimes people will put like a hidden input for, uh, yeah, I don't know if we have a really a need for that. Um, yeah, but it, thinking... like you could put, yeah, sometimes there's hidden inputs to like verify that it's coming from the correct form. Um, I've also seen like the honey pot thing where it'll like put an extra input that's like visually hidden or that's not a screen reader accessible. I don't know how the honeypots work, but those are like 
inputs that only bots would fill in and if it has stuff in it and you know that it's not a real person that kind of thing yeah um the that part i think we can figure out later just because the like the honeypot thing is typically set up where you have um like a a visually hidden field with a label that says something like humans should not fill out this field. Um, and it then like accepts a random value, but the label on the field or like the, the actual name of it is like email two or something like that. So that robots mm. like spam bots will go, Oh, email. And it just auto fills it with an email. And then we can dump that submission. So that, cause we know that if somebody filled out email two, like they either read the label and decided to fill it out anyways, or they were like, you know, robo filling things and we don't want any robo filled stuff. So, um, this we do want though to come to include like what page we're on. So I'm going to include a hidden input type hidden. And I want that value to be, or we want the name to be, um, URL. And the value should be, I don't need to do this. I don't need to do this because we're programmatically submitting things. So what we can actually do instead is on handle submit, we can submit origin URL and we can, um, we would want the location, which we can get from, I mean, we could just pull it off like window location. And that wouldn't really be that's, like, that's what came to mind. I don't know if there's like a it's like more react -y way. Location dot path. No. href. Probably href, yeah. I mean and does that give us if like there's a client name? rendered yeah, if you have client rendered path names. Yeah, that does it, that pulls it depends. Way. It depends how those are generated, I think. If it's client side window.location may or may not know about it. I suppose I probably should have like, all right, so let's click around a little bit. Let's go here. We've now like programmatically navigated location, href, and that gives us sweet where people were. That looks like that'll work. It, it even included the, yeah, it even included the hash at the end, which is like an internal link going to a, a heading or something. Yeah. And the submit should only be possible when we are on, um, like it, it shouldn't be possible during server side render. So I believe we can just use it directly. Um, otherwise, it, like sometimes using window, you end up in a, there's some, some problems where like when Gatsby tries to do server side rendering, it looks for window, window is undefined and it explodes. So uh, mm. we may hit an issue when we build this, we'll test it and make sure. Um, so, okay, so we've got that, we've got this, got an origin URL. Um, I need to check over here that we are, you know, we need to include that as well. Oh, that's right. Um, is there then, some kind of a, I haven't checked, is there like a no script warning on Gatsby? Like if we want to require JavaScript for this, I think that's fine. We just need to tell people. Yeah, I, and oh. I think we, like we could work around it. Um, there is a no script warning on, well, we wouldn't need to, we could, no. How are you Let's, sending the data? Right now we're sending it completely by JavaScript and I don't know that it would be possible to not do that. So I- It probably depends on the, the endpoint that you're hitting, right? Yeah. So maybe one thing that we could do is we could like require some JavaScript to even see the thing. Um, that would this, work. This widget has a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's an interactive widget. So I mean, requiring JavaScript makes sense. You just want to, yeah, either not show it if the conditions are wrong or warn people. Yeah. In this so case, in this case, I think you're right. Just not showing it at all is probably the best way to go. Yeah. So let's do this. Let's um, let's just short circuit the whole thing, and up here we're going to say, um, if uh, we're not going to show this widget if JS is disabled. And so to short circuit this, we'll just say if 
type of window equals undefined, we're going to return null and that'll be that. So basically what will happen now is um, as far as our widget is concerned, oh, I forgot to start the server. Let me go back here. We'll go to feedback widget. And if I do a Gatsby develop, that'll give us our server back. I just want to verify that, oh no, where did I break? The module, oh, sharp. <laughs> sharp. <laughs> so sharp, um, if you change your version of node or like sometimes changing terminals, it wants you to rebuild it. And I don't uh, know why. It's irritating. It's, yeah, it's, I mean, the power that it gives us is, is kind of worth it, but like, Oh my God. Is and it... sharp. It was like a tool that already existed outside of, is that like a node specific sharp? thing? I don't even, where think does that, that originate? I don't think sharp is even written in node. I think sharp is like a C. Module That's what I was like wondering. Yeah. Like image magic or some library that like got ported to, to yeah. react. So it still works for us. Um, when we have JavaScript, but like if I build this, Let's build it and make sure it still works. Okay. Let's see if it blows up. I mean, we got we got most of the way through, so I feel like we're in decent shape here. Okay. All right. I think so. So then I can do Gatsby serve, if I can spell it. Gatsby serve. Gatsby sever. <laughs> <laughs> Localhost 9000. Okay, so that's working the way we want. But let's disable JavaScript. And let's see, I'll make this here. What am I? I wish you could do oh, it right this there. Is, this is what I need is settings. We're going to disable JavaScript. Okay, let me uh, lower this a little bit. And what should happen when I refresh the page is this should not show up at all. And it does not. We get our, like, you should have JavaScript enabled thing. Our page still renders, but the feedback widget is gone. So if I go back and re-enable it, are you gonna, you're not gonna let me do that, are you? Here we go. We'll re-enable JavaScript, reload that page, and there's our widget again. Sweet. Um, so, cool. We do have a minor issue where on on uh, sh like short viewports, it's going to blow off the screen. So mm -hmm. we're going to have to fix that. Um, yeah, I think we could. Fix the, I, I know we're going to want to take a design pass at this to make it I, look as spiffy as the rest of <laughs> the there, there are roughly zero universes where uh, Florian Kissling, our designer at Gatsby, does not completely tear this apart. <laughs> so. he, he's gifted, so yeah, uh, he's... we will benefit from some design expertise. But at least functionally, I think if we can get it most of the way there, that, that'll be a really great start. Yeah, so we've got this running. Um, we're also kind of running short on time here, so I don't know if I want to get too deep into the, the API stuff. But so so effectively what I'm going to end up doing is um, we've got this feedback widget that we're going to get back. We've got our submit feedback uh, thing here. And then what I'll be able to do is take Prisma dot um, create feedback. Uh-oh. Did I not? Oh, I'm not importing Prisma here. Um, so if I go up, like Prisma does this cool thing where they um, they have the like TypeScript stuff set up. So if I do like import Prisma from, they have their API declared for Prisma. TypeScript. Yeah, and like whenever you generate it, they do it. For you and so you get these cool. definition files um and what Slick. i want yeah like all these feedback things that we're getting is really cool 
So I uh, changed that thing. So let me run Prisma Generate one more time. And what should happen here is, yeah, it's gonna generate that for us. And then when I import Prisma, is that how I do it? Let's go back over here to the web, look at one of these and we import, where do we import? Um, I swear I had this at some point figured out. Database, is that right? Yeah, import Prisma from Prisma Client. So if I take this, I've imported Prisma from Pr Prisma Client and I should be able to do something like Prisma dot uh, create feedback. And then in here, it's gonna tell me what I need and that will give me the ability to add the comment, um, which would be input.comment, the rating, which would be input.rating, and then we would need the original URL or origin URL, which will be input.origin URL. Um, and so that that strong typing stuff is is super cool. Like it's Maybe the most compelling argument that I've heard for TypeScript is the the developer experience improvements that you get in um, like in, in these types of environments. Um, so you got dogs. That was a dog burp. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he was breathing really heavy. I'm like, I bet they can hear that, and then he just straight up burped. So <laughs> dog <Okay>. child. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think like in the next 15 minutes, we're probably not going to be able to get this up and up and breathing. So for anybody, who especially is, if you, if you have stuff, the client secrets and whatnot that you don't want to show too, if that makes yeah. sense. So I think what, uh, what we'll end up doing next is, um, Marcy, I will, I'll commit this up to like, a, a actually let me do that while we're on the, the stream. So I'm going to take what we've got. Um, we have. Like this is what we've built. I'm gonna create a new repo, which we'll call Gatsby Feedback Widget. Um, so that's gonna create the GitHub origin. And then I'm going to add everything to it. Let's make sure I didn't add anything silly. So we've got our, our components. Um, I guess we don't really need those source components, foo. Oh yeah. <laughs> so let me do that again, get status. All right, so we've got our layout, our feedback widget, our rating option. Um, most likely we could clean this up a little bit, break it up into smaller pieces, but for now this is good enough. So I'm gonna commit, uh, let's see, first draft of accessible feedback widget. And then I'm going to push origin master. Yeah, and I think you're right that that does sound like a compelling use of TypeScript. Um, once you're in longer living applications with more team members, it does make more sense. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's all, the complexity is always like the trade offs trade -offs in so many different directions. And, and I feel like TypeScript has so much power, but it's also this, it's like this hurdle, there's boilerplate, there's additional setup. Um, you have to learn it, like there's more syntax to learn. And now you have to know that there's JavaScript that does support TypeScript syntax and JavaScript that doesn't, and that's complex. So, I mean, I think yeah. there, like there are definitely benefits, but you need, in my, in my opinion, you need to have like sufficient complexity in your app to merit the amount of additional training that's required for everybody on the team. And um, troubleshooting. Like if you're trying to pull in a third party API, like the other day I was trying to pull in a Tito out, like Tito, the event registration, they use a custom element and JSX was like, I don't know what that element is. Yeah. Which, you know, for good reason, but then I have to like go back to the tool chain and like tell it, no, no, this element's fine. And for like sure. that level of complexity for a lot of people is just completely unnecessary for yeah. what you would get out of it. No, I think that totally makes sense. Um, but yeah, I, I think like there are definitely cases where it makes sense in a lot of like early stage cases, or especially if you're doing like 
community powered stuff. I think it, it, unless you're a TypeScript community, it's probably going to deter contributors because that it's just more complexity and tool chain. Um, Definitely. Yeah. A lot of people don't like they're working in react is a leap. And then you add this mm-hmm. additional layer. Um, I heard someone describe of like, it's not an astronomical leap. It's like, well, maybe not for you, but for folks, you know, who maybe are contributing as you know, they're new to coding or new to react every like layer of complexity we add just raises the bar higher and higher. For and sure. so it can get really daunting for people to contribute. So yeah, I would say unless you're a TypeScript community or like a really technical, advanced, long living web application, yeah, maybe don't make it required. For sure. Okay, so um, I think we can we can probably wrap up here. I think we, so the, the code is up now on this uh, Gatsby feedback widget uh, repo. If you, anybody who's watching wants to go check it out. Um, so Marcy, I think here we can kind of, we can split up a little bit. I'll, I'll go do the, the API changes and any API changes that I make will get pull requested into, uh, this repo here, the api.gatsbyjs.org repo. Um, so you can go check that out and see what, uh, what ends up happening to ultimately make this work. Um, and then I guess you'll do a, a pull request into the docs. Uh, and we'll, we'll get this thing fully up and breathing. Ooh, I'm excited. Well, cool. Uh, so we've, we've officially put three hours on the books. (laughs) Um, thank you for 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 sticking with us for anybody who's still watching. Let's go take a a real break. Um, maybe eat some lunch or something and sounds good. We will see everyone next time. Oh, we're doing another live stream here soon. Aren't we? We're doing it on. Yes. April 18th, I believe. Yeah, let's let's check it out. We're gonna do an accessibility live stream, and I think we were originally um, talking about picking up where Can't See Dodds left off, so we could talk about testing, which yeah. we didn't really get in. We didn't get into here today, so we certainly did not. So if you're if anyone is still watching, you can ask us for mm-hmm. things that you would like us to cover in that session. So yeah. you have time. Um, do it on like. Twitter is probably better because we're about to shut down the stream, which means the chat is going to go away. But, oh, uh, yes. Tell us on can, Twitter. You can get at me or you can get at Marcy. Um, you should follow both of us, uh, probably her more than me because she's smarter than I am. But um, we, yeah. Nonsense. Let's, let's, <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's definitely connect on Twitter. We'll see you on the live stream on April 18th. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Yeah, thanks for hanging in there with us. All right, we'll see you later.